Good morning. My name is James Valentine, and welcome to the externally led patient focused drug development meeting for polyglutamine spinocerebellar ataxias and dentatorubral pallidoluysian atrophy, also known as SCA and DRPLA. We're coming to you live from the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, actually not too far from where the U.S. Food and Drug Administration headquarters are. To open today's meeting, it is my pleasure to introduce my appropriately socially distanced co-host, Andrew Rosen, the executive director of the National Ataxia Foundation. Andrew. Hello, Ataxia Nation. My name is Andrew Rosen, and I'm the executive director of the National Ataxia Foundation. I'd like to welcome you to the externally-led patient-focused drug development meeting on the polyglutamine spinocerebellar ataxias and DRPLA. I can't believe this day is finally here, and on International Ataxia Awareness Day to boot. A special shout out to the many member, staff members of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration that are taking the time to join us today. I know that you're going to learn a lot from this wonderfully brave group of people affected by ataxia, their parents, spouses, and caregivers who are sharing their experiences, and we're excited to have you with us. Thank you for taking the time. And another special welcome to our industry sponsors who have so generously helped to cover the cost of this meeting. Thank you to Biohaven Pharmaceuticals, Ionis Pharmaceuticals, Takeda, Unicure, and Vico Therapeutics. But most importantly, I want to welcome the members of the audience who live with ataxia. This meeting is about you and for you. I joined NAF at the beginning of 2019, and one thing became very clear to me almost immediately. It is the dawning of a new age for all those affected by ataxia. After so many years of being told, you have something called ataxia, it's going to get worse, and there's really not much you can do about it, that message is changing. The pharmaceutical industry has become very interested in the ataxias in the past several years, with numerous research studies and clinical trials already in progress and being planned for the near future. The unmet medical need of treatments and an eventual cure for ataxia is no longer just some vague hope for the future. That is why this meeting is so important today. Many of you will have the chance to share your stories directly with the FDA explaining the symptoms of the disease that have the most impact on your daily lives. We know thousands of you in the U.S. alone are affected by the various forms of ataxia that we're discussing today, and many more have joined us from around the world. We have so much to learn from you all, and your involvement today is critical. You'll have the chance to respond to a number of polling questions online and also make comments directly to the audience. I know watching this on a screen cannot replace meeting in person, but please hang in there with us. It will be well worth your time. I'd now like to introduce Andrea Compton, president and co-founder of Cure DRPLA. Andrea has been a wonderful partner to NAF during the planning of this meeting. Andrea. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning. My name is Andrea Compton, and I am the president and co-founder of DRPLA. By way of introduction, dentaturubral pallidoluysian atrophy, commonly referred to as DRPLA or DERPLA, is an autosomal dominant trinucleotide repeat disease, similar to the spinocerebellar ataxias that are being dis discussed today. Due to these characteristics, it's a fitting addition to today's meeting. Cure DRPLA was founded in 2018, shortly after my son, Tayson, was diagnosed with the disease. Tayson was tested for the disease only because we had been contacted by his birth family and told that his birth mother had tested positive for the disease. If it wasn't for this communication, he never would have been tested. At that time, Taysen presented with epilepsy and cognitive difficulties, a combination that isn't uncommon. The only other symptom that Taysen had during that period that, that was of concern was a decreasing IQ. Taysen started in kindergarten with an IQ of 90 at a school for children with learning difficulties due to some learning challenges that were identified at age four. He did really well his first year, but the second year he stopped progressing. At that time, we learned that his IQ had dropped to 70. After a few more years of little to no progress, we, and at the onset of epilepsy, we transferred taste into a school for children with more severe learning issues, which where he remains today. His IQ is now 57. Tayson's chronological age is 14, although his cognitive age is much closer to three. He, suffer, he slurs his words tremendously. I'm one of the few people that can understand him. 
His balance is deteriorating. He can no longer stand on a dock to fish a crab due to the minor undulations of the water. He stopped riding a bicycle years ago. He suffers an increasing frequency of seizures and takes 19 pills a day, 16 of which are for seizure control. I live in fear of the future, knowing what the DRPLA disease progression looks like. Taysen's story has similarities as well as differences with others with juvenile onset DRPLA. He, um, and today is about hearing from patients and the caregivers. We want the FDA and other stakeholders to hear directly from those, from those affected what is the similarities as well as the heterogeneity amongst these diseases. As you will hear today as well, there is a massive unmet need to treat these diseases. I truly hope that by the end of the day, you will understand why it's so important to develop treatments for these diseases, as well as what treatments could be most meaningful for the population. On a lighter note, NAF has been a wonderful partner. They have an amazing team of thoughtful, hardworking individuals that have made planning for today actually fun. Today, I hope that you will find sharing your stories as fulfilling as we have found organizing this meeting. We will hear from many, we hope to hear from many patients, caregivers, and spouses during the meeting with regards to their experiences. It's these perspectives that are so critical to help inform future disease research and drug development for SCAS and DRPLA. Thank you. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you, Andrea. I'd now like to introduce Dr. Wilson Bryan, Director of the Office of Tissues and Advanced Therapies in the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research at the Food and Drug Administration, to provide some opening remarks. Dr. Bryan. Good morning. On behalf of the FDA, it is my privilege to make a few opening remarks for this meeting to discuss the ataxias. What I want to talk about is education. And for me, uh, my medical education began, it's, gosh, it's been over 40 years ago when I enrolled in medical school. And for me, the, the opportunity to become a doctor was a great honor and privilege. After medical school, I, I trained as a neurologist and then uh, specialized in neuromuscular disorders. So at that time, I, I worked for well over a decade at a neuromuscular clinic in Texas and had the privilege of taking care of, of many patients with hereditary forms of ataxia. But back then in the 1990s, it, it was very different. Uh, we were... The, the science of the ataxia is, was, was just beginning to be understood. And, and we didn't have good genetic tests to uh, distinguish the different forms of ataxia. I'm, I'm not sure when I first heard the word polyglutamine. And, and so I'm, I'm looking forward to the presentation by Dr. Wilmot to, to update me on, on what's happened in the science. Fortunately, the science has moved forward in the last couple of decades so that now we do have good diagnostic tests that allow us to distinguish the different forms of ataxia. And, and I believe that this science is on the verge of, of not just helping us with diagnosis, but bringing us forward to, to treatments that will really have an impact on this disease. I have the privilege of working at the FDA in the uh, part of the FDA that deals with gene therapies. And uh, over the past three years, we have approved our first five uh, gene therapies in this country. And, and that includes one gene therapy uh, for the treatment of a rare neuromuscular disorder. 
I am extremely optimistic that over the years ahead, we are going to have not dozens, but hundreds of gene therapies come forward. And that will include gene therapies for ataxis. This is going to happen. And, and it's meetings like this that help us to advance the development and the regulation of these products that are going to come into development. So how does that happen? Well, well, these meetings, what we hear helps the FDA to think about how clinical trials should be designed. For example, it helps us to think about how long do the studies need to be to find an effect and helps us to think about what sort of monitoring of the patients needs to occur to protect their safety and what eligibility criteria are important, which patients are going to be the best to enroll in each specific trial. What we hear today helps us to think about endpoints for these trials. Which endpoints are most relevant to patients? What is clinically meaningful to the patients? And we also need to think about how do patients want us to balance benefits and risks? As the FDA is somewhat of a paternal organization, we have to make decisions for a lot of people in this country. And, and we need to hear from you and, and what matters to you and how you would want us to balance benefits and risks. So, so that brings me back to education and a reminder that when it, when it comes to medicine, the, the best education always comes from the patients. And you as patients and caregivers help us to learn. When you participate in meetings like this, when you enroll for clinical trials, because Clinical trials to move us forward won't happen unless you're willing to participate. And also when you serve on FDA advisory committees. So I would like to thank the good folks who organized this meeting to give us the opportunity to hear from you and the patients and you, the patients and the caregivers, and particularly thank you for participating in this meeting because what we hear from you today gives us the opportunity to continue our me medical education so that we can work with you in helping to bring forward new therapies. And with that, I'll turn it back to Andrew in the studio. Thank you, Dr. Brian. We so appreciate your comments and educating us on why this meeting is so important to those of you at the FDA. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Chip Wilmot, Assistant Professor of Movement Disorders at Emory University, to give us cl a clinical overview of the SCAs and treatments. Dr. Wilmot. Thank you very much. Um, so today, uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, it's wonderful to give you an overview today. It's going to be uh, just a very kind of clinically based. There's so much information to cover on these complex set of diseases that I'm really kind of limited in 15 minutes to be able to give a basic overview of where we stand right now. Um, we have a long way to go to help out patients more. But with a little overview of the clinical features and how we currently deal with treatment, I think we'll be better po um, posed um, to go ahead and, and think about the future. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges for drug development and things that this meeting is designed to um, help make better. Let's go to the next slide. So um, what is spinocerebellar ataxia? Um, this is a little complicated. Um, and it's, I. You know, there are people on, on here that, that might not understand all the genetic principles. So um, the bottom line is that ataxia, which refers to incoordination of movement, 
um, can affect a lot of people. And those, sometimes it's genetic and sometimes it's not. If it's genetic and inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion, it's technically a spinocerebellar ataxia. And there are almost 50 named spinocerebellar ataxias, or SCAs, or SCA, sometimes we say. Um, in addition, there's a few autosomal dominant ataxias that don't um, carry the SCA name. And the reason I call them an ataxia is simply that they have ataxia as a major feature. It might not be the only feature, but it is a major feature of their disease. And a good example of that would be, this might be the last time you hear this name, I'm going to go ahead and say it, dentato rubro pallido Louisian atrophy, or DERPLA. You can see why we call it DERPLA or, or DRPLA. Um, and the reason to lump DRPLA in with the ataxias is exactly what Andrea had mentioned before, that they share a mechanism of what the genetic abnormality is, and that is that they're polyglutamine diseases. What do we mean by polyglutamine diseases? What we mean is that the mutation in the gene is an expansion, an expansion of a normally repetitive element that ends up giving the instructions for a protein that is made based on the DNA um, sequence. And that um, mutation makes the incorporation of a string of glutamine amino acids that's too long. And that extra length of the glutamine in the particular protein that is coded for that gene ends up causing problems. Um, I will note that my slide there says uh, coded for by the affected protein that should say the affected gene. So what are the polyglutamine ataxias, if you will? They're SCA 1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 8, 17, and I'm going to include the DERPLA in there because DERPLA does have um, some uh, other features that are that um, strongly overlap with all of the ataxias, namely ataxia and some of the other problems. SCA8 is a little bit different. Um, it, the, the, the gene structure and how it's expressed is a little bit different, but it's still lumped in this general category. Let's go on to the next slide. So let's talk about the, the clinical features. Well, the way I always think about clinical features as a neurologist, and again, this meeting is a wonderful meeting because I get to hear what patients um, think about these things. This is more what I think as a neurologist, and the two are not always the same, and we have to hear the feedback from patients. The main way I think about clinical problems are that they reflect the dysfunction in those neural systems that are dysfunctional. So in other words, ataxia is caused by cerebellar dysfunction because normally the cerebellum helps coordinate movement. So when you have a damaged cerebellum, you'll get ataxia. Similarly, you might get problems with coordination of speech, which would cause slurring of speech, that's dysarthria, problems with coordination of swallowing, that's dysphagia. The impaired balance comes from the ataxia, both in your arms and legs and also in the trunk. Um, the cerebellum is also normally very involved in eye movements. And so when cerebellar dysfunction occurs, we'll see eye movement abnormalities. Nystagmus is something that people know a lot, and that's just the name for when the eyes kind of move repetitively. Um, that's very common in cerebellar dysfunction. Um, cognitive and emotional changes can happen purely from cerebellar problems. And the reason they happen purely from the cerebellar problems is that the thinking parts of the brain, the cortex up front, are linked up with the cerebellum through loops. Your entire brain is linked up through the cerebellum. So cerebellum uh, problems will, cerebellar problems will end up potentially causing um, problems in cognition and problems with emotional processing as well. Similarly, it can affect um, bladder function. Can we go to the next slide? Um, and then it's not just the cerebellum in most of these diseases that's affected. It's also other neurologic areas in the brain. So you might get spasticity, which is tightness of muscles and uh, oftentimes muscle cramps, increased reflexes we see on an exam. 
uh, myoclonus, which is a quick twitching of muscles, motor neuron disease, which can be similar to uh, ALS or that disease uh, that Dr. Brian talked about before, SMA, which I might mention a little bit later. Um, we can see neuropathy, damage to the nerves in the arms and legs, and that can end up causing numbness. Or sometimes patients don't even feel the numbness, but they lose sensation in their arms or legs. Chorea or dystonia is common in certain diseases and not so much in others. Um, and um, that's an extra kind of writhing movement um, that is uncontrollable. Dystonia is a tightness of muscles. Double vision can happen. Um, and um, that would be due to lock, not the eyes not lining up quite right. Visual loss, uh, dementia and intellectual deterioration, as we've already heard about from uh, uh, Andrea, can, can occur in some of these uh, conditions, as well as the seizures and vertigo, which is dizziness that gives you a sensation of movement. Uh, let me note that n this is a lot. This is an awful lot. And that's the feature of these diseases, that they have what we call protean manifestations, right? They can do a whole bunch of different things. And there's variability. There's variability within a particular disease, meaning somebody with SCA3 is not going to look and have the same symptoms as somebody else with SCA3 ne um, necessarily. And then they can vary between diseases. So SCA7, for instance, always has visual loss associated with it. There's a retinopathy that can happen in SCA7, but the amount of, ver of visual loss can vary from pretty minimal to um, very, very significant total visual loss. Uh, seizures, much more common in uh, DRPLA than many of the other ataxias. Um, visual loss can happen in some of the other ataxias, but is really quite rare. So it really, um, varies between diseases as well as in, uh, within a disease. Let's go to the next slide. So those are kind of direct neuronal damage things that, that cause symptoms according to what systems are affected. And um, some of the things that are listed here can also be caused by neuronal involvement, but they can also be indirectly caused, not, to, not from the um, neuronal damage itself, but they're in symptoms of the disease nonetheless. Depression um, can, has features that are affected by the brain involvement, but also you can't neglect the issues of um, the psychosocial stressors that can happen um, living with a disease like this um, and how that can impact you and that can affect your emotional state. So depression, fatigue, sleep disturbances, um, deconditioning. Some people really, you know, they really lose the ability to walk um, to at least some degree as a snowball effect when it becomes harder because they're just not able to do as much and then the deconditioning takes over. Um, and they get weak from just not being on their feet very much. Constipation, other um, uh, bladder dysfunction can happen because of this. And then I think we can't ignore consequence of falls or the consequences of aspiration, which is when stuff goes down the wrong way. Um, sometimes these cause really significant problems, even death, in the ataxias because somebody falls and breaks something and then is in the hospital and gets an infection or whatever, um, or uh, has an aspiration pneumonia. These are uh, indirect consequences of the ataxia. Let's go to the next slide. So how do we treat these? Well, we can treat symptoms, and that's mainly what we do now. Uh, we would love to be able to treat with disease-altering therapies or neuroprotective therapies. Um, that's kind of the holy grail we're reaching for at some point in the future. And I, as we get um, some genetic approaches, which are coming on now, um, we will achieve this, and we're excited about that. Um, I just throw out education about genetic risk because I do think that can uh, is an important aspect, but it really doesn't uh, revolve around what we're talking about today. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so for symptomatic therapy, um, right now in terms of approved therapies, 
Um, there really isn't anything for the actual incoordination. The predominant symptom of the ataxia is we really don't have something right now that is approved that clearly everybody agrees improves coordination and makes ataxia less. We would love to have that, and there are clinical trials going on where we're trying to find that and other things that are planned for the future. Um, for, so we rely on the rehab therapies, basically physical therapy for gait and movement, um, uh, speech therapy for the dysphagia, where we might thicken liquids. Uh, we can use medicines for other things like spasticity, myoclonus, depression, um, fatigue, although um, um, not all of these are very well treated by the, the medicines. Nystagmus can be treat, treated. We can use prism glasses for diplopia. So I guess my point is these are things we can apply to anybody with a neurologic condition. Anybody with depression, we can give an anti antidepressant. And we can give that to an ataxia patient. And so it's very important to note that we still, as a doctor, treating an ataxia patient can care for that patient and make a difference in that patient's life um, as with the available medicines that we have right now. And in general, the medicines to treat these symptoms work about as well as they do in other people, but they don't, but that isn't always great. And so we need to continue to work on that kind of symptomatic improvement um, in therapies. And we definitely need to work on improve, getting approaches to improve cerebellar function and therefore uh, ataxia. Let's go to the next slide. For the disease-altering or neuroprotective approach, again, we don't have anything right now, but there is a ton of interest in this. One of the interesting things is that in animal models, um, it's been shown that uh, some exercise, really kind of light cardio type of work, actually does have neuroprotective benefit. So we always like to, ex to recommend exercise to patients. That's above and beyond what it just does for your cardiovascular fitness. It actually improves the brain a little bit in animal models. Never proven that for humans, but we like to think that it probably um, exists in the same way. Um, and I just echo the statements that were said before by Dr. Bryan. It, this is an exciting time because we have just have so many more tools for the genetic conditions now. And in other polyglutamine diseases like Huntington's disease, which typically does not have ataxia and isn't, isn't included here, there have been some human trials to, that have already started and um, have some encouraging results. It's, it's nothing you know, that, that is approved or anything like that right now, but in the pipeline um, is an approach to be able to affect the expression of that mutant allele that is generating the toxic polyglutamine protein. Because of the similarities between um, the ataxia, all of the polyglutamine diseases, we can use a similar approach. So what we learn in other polyglutamine diseases um, affects the other polyglutamine diseases, and that's really exciting. What we learn in SCA3 will help the development of an SCA1 neuroprotective treatment. They have to be done separately. They are set different diseases. They are different genes. They do have some you know, differences, certainly, but there's a lot of convergence of information and education here, which is super helpful. Let's go on to the next slide. And the challenges for drug development really are um, it's relatively rare. I mean, um, it's, it's all too common for you know, people who are, are dealing with it, obviously, but in the spectrum of things, these are relatively rare disease and they progress relatively slowly. Um, again, a lot of variability um, within the different diseases. Um, and there's this variability between different diseases and within each disease. And what these two things mean, or, or the implication for both of these, are that we have to study patients for a longer period of time, and we need more patients in each study because we have to statistically overcome the variability that's there. Um, and so that's, that's a real challenge. 
Um, one way of meeting the challenge is try to get the best measurements of the disease that we can. If we have a really good measurement, then we um, can say more about the effectiveness of a treatment. Um, and that's an ongoing thing. I just don't have time to talk about all the different ways that we can measure disease, but it is a, a huge issue. Um, we think we have some pretty good measurements now, but we want to have improved measurements uh, going into the future. And it's really important that we have measurements that are relevant for the patients um, and that are things that are also um, based, you know, um, have some relevance to the underlying disease. What we would like to also be able to develop um, as a part of this measurement thing, we're working on looking for other markers of the disease that potentially can follow things along. But we always have to keep in mind that our ultimate goal is to make the lives of ataxia patients and derpla patients better. Um, let's go to the next slide. So in conclusion, the polyglutamine ataxias, they have the same mechanism of a CAG expansion that causes a polyglutamine tract to enlarge in a protein, but then each one is in a different gene, so it has specific features. There's manifestations that are determined largely by what part of the brain is kind of affected. Um, and we can treat some of the, those symptoms, um, just like we can in any patient, with variable uh, effectiveness. Um, but most of the treatment that is most effective that has approved therapies are for the uh, involvement from the non-cerebellar areas. Next slide. For the cerebellar dysfunction, most, most of the cerebellar dysfunction, um, you know, the rehabilitation theories are just the mainstay of what we do right now. We hope that changes as we move forward in development of treatments. We need to keep deciding what is the key, what are the key clinical features and how can we best measure them? Because that will really help in drug development. And uh, finally, you know, we are optimistic about the near future um, being able to deliver in the promise of our great genetic age where we can develop um, disease-altering and, and neuroprotective therapy, therapies. And we um, really think this can um, be a reachable goal for the polyglutamine ataxias and derpletin. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to, to talk here. I'm going to send it back to Andrew and James. Thank you, Dr. Wilmot. You helped us understand what is clearly a very complex set of diseases. Now, to take us to the core of today's meeting, I'd like to introduce our moderator, James Valentine. James worked at the FDA and helped create the patient-focused drug development program. Since the program has become externally led, he has facilitated dozens of these meetings over the past five years. James has been working with us on the planning of this meeting over the past year, and we are in very good hands today. James. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to be with you all. And uh, as Andrew said, now we really do get to turn to the core of today's meeting to hear from you. And this comes on the heels of having just heard the, a clinical overview um, of these complex uh, conditions from a disease expert, as well as from a colleague from the Food and Drug Administration. Um, so now this is the part of the meeting where we want to hear from you, individuals living with polyglutamine SCAs and DRPLA as well as their direct caregivers about the experiences of persons living with these ataxias. Patient-focused drug development is a more systematic way of gathering patient perspectives on their condition and on available treatments. As you heard from FDA's Dr. Wilson Bryan, your input can help inform the agency's understanding of these ataxias to inform both drug development and review. So far, FDA has held 26 of its own patient-focused drug development meetings, and today marks the 38th externally-led PFDD, and due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, it's the sixth vir fully virtual PFDD of its kind. With 7,000 known rare diseases alone, this is a unique and important opportunity for this community. So let me tell you a little bit about today's meeting. Today's meeting is interactive. Um, and we're gonna be asking uh, for you to participate throughout the day. We're gonna be doing this and discussing two major areas that we wanna learn from you. First, we'll be exploring the patient and caregiver experience with living with ataxias and its impacts on your daily life. Once we've done that in our second session, 
will bring everybody back together to explore the various approaches to treatments. And we'll be asking you for your preferences for future treatment and regarding participation in trials. How will we structure those discussions, those two discussions that we'll have? Well, we really have three major kind of methods, we'll call them, for, for hearing from you. Uh, first, we're going to start with some panels, panels of patients and caregivers living with ataxia. They're going to set a good foundation for our discussion. They were individuals selected to help reflect a range of experiences, but of course, no group of any individuals can represent all of the experiences. And so because of that, once we hear that from those panels, we're then going to broaden the discussion to all of you that are live with us in our virtual audience today, patients and caregivers that are tuned in. I'm going to be asking questions and inviting you to provide your comments, to share your experiences. This can be done in one of two ways. I'll be inviting you to dial in by phone uh, and asking you to actually speak live with us today on the air. Um, you can also, though, provide written comments throughout the day. The instructions for both of those can be found on the web page that you're following along in this live stream, and we'll be sharing those instructions as well throughout the day. Uh, we also have invited uh, a group of patients and caregivers to serve as, uh, on a Zoom panel, and they'll be sharing their experiences as well. Uh, when you do uh, write in or call in, we do ask that you state your name as well as your diagnosis before you answer. Uh, that will help us with tracking your responses throughout the day. Finally, we're going to be broadening the conversation also through the use of polling questions. We're asking patients and caregivers only to use phones uh, or uh, browsers on your computers to respond. I'll tell you how to do that shortly when we get to our first set of polling questions. Uh, but you'll be able to follow along live on the web and answer those questions throughout the day. And this is really going to be our way to pull everybody into this discussion and understand the experiences of our audience. I do want to note that uh, whether you're live with us today uh, or maybe you're viewing this uh, as a uh, recording uh, on demand, uh, we will be collecting written comments for 30 days following this meeting. So if there's something you just didn't get to say, or like I said, if you're following along uh, in the on-demand on recording, your voice can still be heard. You can still submit written comments on the web form under the recording. All of this input, both today and anything submitted after, will be summarized in what is called a voice of the patient report. This is the official summary of the meeting that will be uh, provided to the FDA, as well as be made publicly available for researchers and developers to reference. So before we move into our first set of polling questions, I want to start uh, set some ground rules for today. So we very much encourage individuals with ataxias and their caregivers to contribute to the dialogue. Remember, that's polling, call in by phone, write in with comments. The conversation is limited to individuals with ataxia and their family members only. Our uh, stakeholders at the FDA, drug developers, and clinicians are here to listen. I also want to mention that views expressed today are inherently personal, and the discussion may get emotional at times, given the nature of what we'll be talking about. So I just implore you to, of course, be respectful of one another, and to that end, try to be focused and concise in your comments so that way we can hear as many voices as possible. So with that out of the way, uh, now we're gonna go into our first set of polling questions. So pull out that phone, open up a new tab in your browser, and we're gonna ask uh, what we're calling our demographic polling questions. We wanna get a sense of who we have in the audience today. So uh, in that, when you open up that browser, whether that's on your phone or elsewhere, type in pollev.com forward slash ataxia. Uh, you can see that displayed on the screen right now. Um, and you'll just stay on that website, keep that open. We'll be asking you at, throughout the day to pull that phone back out, open that browser back up, and those questions will be there. Um, so this first question we have for you is as it relates to the uh, spinocerebellar ataxias uh, that are, are within our scope today, as well as DRPLA, are you either A, an individual living with one of these conditions, or B, a parent, spouse, partner, or other caregiver of an individual with one. So here we want to hear from you. These, this is, you know, you are, if you're listed on this slide, that means you're our experts today. You're who we want to hear from. Um, and we're at this point are just getting a little bit of a sense of who we have represented. So 
So we'll give you a few more moments to get into the system. I know this is our first question. We wanna make sure that everybody's getting in, accessing the system. We'll be able to move a little bit more quickly through some of these uh, other demographic questions that we have. So while results are still trickling in here, coming in, um, it's looking like though we've got a, a good representation across both our um, individuals living with SCA and DRPLA as well as their caregivers. And we're seeing about uh, two thirds of our audience are actually individuals living with one of these conditions and about a third of the audience are those caring for them. Um, so with that, we'll move into our second polling question. So here we wanna know uh, where does the affected individual live? So if you're a person with an ataxia, please respond for yourself. If you're a caregiver, we're gonna, these questions are, uh, you're gonna be ask, or answering them um, with respect to the, the person that you care for. So where does the person live? The options are A, in the uh, US Northeast, B, the US Mid-Atlantic, C, the US Midwest, D, the US Mountain Region, E, the US West Coast, F in Asia, G in Africa, F or H in Australia or New Zealand, I in Canada, J in Central or South America, K in Europe or the UK, L in Japan, or M some other uh, region not represented here on the slide. So as results are coming in, I promise our questions a little later today will be more interesting, uh, but it is great to get a sense of uh, the representativeness of, of this population or, or the audience today. And we're seeing great representativeness here. We're seeing um, uh, participants from all across the United States. Um, and we are seeing some uh, of our, our members of this community outside of the United States, um, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and in Europe and the UK, as well as some other regions, so that's wonderful. Thank you for being here with us. If we can go to our third polling question. So here, wh what is the affected individual's age? Um, so the, the per if you're an individual living with a uh, taxi, well, how old are you? If you're a caregiver, how old is the person for which you care? Uh, the options are A, younger than age 12, B, 12 to 17 years, C, 18 to 29 years, D, 30 to 39 years, E, 40 to 49 years, F, 50 to 59 years, G, 60 to 69 years, H, 70 to 79 years, or I, old, uh, age 80 or older. James, you can see, as Dr. Wilmot talked about, the onset uh, of the different types of ataxias um, is, very, is, is different, right? Mm -hmm. And so you're seeing that in these results. You've got, peop you've got young people and much older people affected, and uh, I think it's, it's playing out here. Yeah, we're seeing uh, quite, again, a, a wide range of uh, individuals represented across all the age ranges. We're seeing, um, you know, the greatest age ranges, uh, those between 40 and, and 69. So um, a lot of uh, middle-aged folks, um, but we do have representation of, of uh, some pediatric patients and some young adult patients uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, some of our, uh, I don't know how to politely say this, uh, but you know, better aged uh, patients. More, more experienced Yeah, patients. more experienced. Uh, so with that, we'll move to our fourth question. So uh, getting to uh, that diagnosis, so now that we know the age range of those that are represented, uh, at what age was the affected individual actually diagnosed with their SCA or DRPLA? Options here being birth to two years, for A, B, three to eight years, C, nine to 18 years, D, 19 to 30 years, E, 31 to 49 years, F, 50 to 65 years, G, over 66 years, or H, if you're not sure the age at which the person was uh, diagnosed. So what we're seeing here is it looks like we're actually fairly aligned that people, you know, the distribution we saw earlier pretty closely matches this, maybe a slight shift to the 30s and, and 40s, 
mm -hmm. um, for diagnosis. And of course, those individuals are represented here today at a, a little bit of an older age, you know, um, becoming more experienced with the condition. Um, but we do have representation across each of these uh, age ages of diagnosis with, um, you know, very few, but some diagnosed, you know, before age eight, so young childhood. And we know that the diagnostic odyssey for some of these people can take years yes. with the complexity of the disease and the and the lack of awareness even within the medical community it can take longer uh, than we'd like it to um, sure. to get a diagnosis so i think you're seeing some of that here as well thank you we go to our fifth polling question so uh, here we want to know uh, after the affected individual started experiencing symptoms how long was it before the genetic testing was confirmed uh, or confirmed the diagnosis? So getting to that exact point, you know, it looks like, you know, uh, from that last polling question there, you know, perhaps, you know, the diagnostic odyssey was reflected with a little bit of an older age of diagnosis. Um, you know, so thinking back, you know, how long was it um, from when you or your loved one first experienced a symptom of your ataxia and then how long did it take to get that genetic, uh, genetically confirmed diagnosis? Options being a, uh, a, less than one year, B, one to two years, C, three to five years, D, more than five years, or E, if you're not quite sure. Uh, so as it stands, it looks like, uh, you know, there's a, a, a fairly uh, kind of uh, even distribution across this. I mean, we're talking, you know, relatively close here, but maybe the, the most common being more than five years, uh, uh, just under a third of everybody in that category. And then you're seeing around 20% for each of those less than one year, one to two years, or three to five years. And there are there is a group a little over 10% that aren't sure. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's hard to know exactly what is a symptom or not of your ataxia. Maybe that might be driving uh, those responses. So thank you so much for answering this. And our sixth and final demographic polling question, if we can go to that. And so here we actually do want to know uh, what that diagnosis is. So uh, what condition um, has have you or your loved one been diagnosed with? A, DRPLA, B, SCA1, C, SCA2, uh, D, SCA3, E, SCA6, F, SCA7, uh, G, SCA8, or H, SCA17. So please let us know uh, that your, uh, your or your loved one's uh, diagnosis. Great to see uh, all of yeah, the, the ataxias that we're uh, discussing today represented here. Um, you know, we're seeing it looks like about a third, the most uh, uh, common represented today being SCA3. We believe SCA3 is the most prevalent. Most prevalent. So that makes sense. Followed by SCA6 and SCA2, but you know, seeing you know between five and ten percent in each of the others, which is wonderful. And yeah. we want to hear from each and every one of these uh, types of ataxias today. So please, please uh, call in, write in, and share your experiences. Um, so with that, we're going to uh, head out of uh, these uh, polling questions, and we're going to move into that first topic I talked about which is what it is to live with the symptoms um, of these ataxias and what that means uh, in your daily life. What are those impacts? In this session, we're gonna uh, you know, be asking you to think about what are the top uh, symptoms and health effects of ataxia that most uh, are most bothersome or most impact your daily life. How, what does that look like? What is, how might that uh, vary day to day, week to week, month to month, or over the course even of years of progression? Um, maybe what does a best day versus a worst day look like? Um, you know, we want to know not just what those symptoms are, but what are the impacts? What activities maybe in your life that are important to you are you not able to do maybe at all or as fully because of your ataxia? And finally, knowing that not all of your symptoms uh, in, in your, uh, what will be your life's journey with ataxia may be the ones you've already experienced. Um, but what knowing um, you know, about this condition, what worries you the most about be living with ataxia? Do you have any fears for the future? And so to get us started on this uh, topic, we have a great uh, panel. Uh, actually, we have a pair of panels. The first panel that we have is gonna focus more on um, the symptoms of ataxia, um, including the ataxia itself and the other neuromuscular impacts. 
And uh, the brave individuals who are going to share these uh, their stories first are Stephanie, Destiny, Gina, Jason, Jason, and Sherry. Stephanie, take it away. Hi, my name is Stephanie Wilkins, and I've had ataxia symptoms since 2006, 14 years. I kind of knew there was something going on because I was starting to fumble and I couldn't wear heels any longer, starting right then. And I couldn't walk in the grass. I remember um, sitting down on the street corner and on the curb, talking to friends, not being able to get back up at that point. So I was, you know, continuing to have balance problems and I was walking and I had stability issues, but they really, really manifested that year in 2006. And in the next few years, I was no longer playing sports or bowling or doing anything that I normally would do. I was very coordinated. I was a good pitcher, but I no longer had coordination. I also noted, noticed about that time that I was taking notes as part of my job and train the trainers of computer people that no one could read them. And they said my handwriting was so bad they couldn't read my notes. Well, I knew something must be bad by now because I had always had pretty good handwriting up to that point. On a personal note, I was also a pretty good dancer. My husband's a very good dancer. And we couldn't do that any longer. We used to dance at every New Year's Eve party and weddings, but that was now gone for me. Team members by now at work were asking if I was okay. They told me that management was thinking I was drunk or hungover because of the way I was walking. At that point, I didn't know about ataxia, so I didn't really even know to defend myself. Um, I didn't even think that anything really was happening at that point. I had not really known about the family, and I had been going to many doctors, six years of doctors, and they finally um, did my test for a taxi because I heard of it by then. And I talked them into it. They sent a panel testing maybe four of the ataxias that I had researched, and it came back positive for SCA6. I did pursue the diagnosis knowing that things would be at risk like long-term long -term care and um, insurance policies, but I had to know. I needed to know for me, for my family, and for my children. I retired at that point at 59, moved from California to my home here in Kansas City, my hometown, and I wanted to find out more about this genetic diagnosis and other people in the family. We left our two kids in California. And I now have more falls, limitations to stairs, and use the computer for all my writing and corresponding needs. So I have nystagmus and eye movement problems. I do remember driving north though, thinking I shouldn't be doing this. So I have given driving up and decided I didn't want to get hurt and I didn't want anyone else to get hurt. So I decided just try and work from home. I mostly volunteer, quit working, and I use a computer for most everything I do. My uh, symptoms are getting worse now. I've used a walker for about four years full time. And I think they're escalating much more than the past 14 years. And they're much stronger now. Usually the voice is affected greatly with spinal cerebellar of any kind. Um, I'm just now starting a real shaky voice. And I know that I'm mumbling in the evenings. I have shaky arms, legs, and hands now, and laughing and sneezing are my latest problems. Challenges, leaking and looking for a restroom is what I do now. 
I'm choking on water. That's my latest challenge. Um, I probably need a thickening agent. I deal with all these symptoms as they come, but I worry that I will not be able to take care of my personal hygiene and care. And I worry that I gave this to my two children. They're only in their 30s. I'm sure, well, I hope not, but it probably will affect them sooner than it did me. Hello, my name is Destiny Waters. I was clinically diagnosed with spinal cerebellar ataxia type 2 on November 14, 2017. For me, this medical condition has taken away my ability to work, go to school, drive, and my ability to walk. Not being able to drive makes me feel upset because I see all my friends driving. My social life has been impacted by not being able to join my friends in normal teenager activities. My senior year of high school, as I struggled to participate in physical education and difficult to get from class to class, my balance and coordination are affected, so I would leave class early to avoid the crowded halls. Right before Christmas break, when walking to my class without human support, my leg muscles have my gave out and I was unable to walk. This forced me to make the decision to finish my senior year online. This disorder has impacted the nerves and coordination in both of my hands craving tremors. Because of these tremors, I had trouble doing my own makeup and painting my own nails. SCA2 has impacted my leg muscles, causing leg spasms, causes double vision. I get double vision when I try to read my phone screen or a book. What happens is all of a sudden my eyesight gets blurry and my eyeballs start to shake. It affects my balance and coordination, making me look drunk while walking and slurring when I talk. Since all of this regarding my ataxia, I had trouble showering, walking, playing volleyball, lifeguarding, and walking on ice. On my good days, I do majority of everything by myself, with a minimum amount of help. I wake up at a normal time, do my makeup, feel more energized. Walk with the walker, get dressed, and use grab bars instead of human support to help with stairs and taking a shower. On what I thought was going to be a good day, I was at the mall with my friend and we were walking in a candy store. I wasn't using my walker or human support. I ended up losing my balance and falling and screaming. When I fall like that, I don't get a warning just before it happens because my muscles will give out suddenly. Instead of asking if I was okay, customers and workers just glanced with an angry face. A worker came up and asked me to leave in a very rude tone. It's hard for a teenager when good days can easily turn to bad days. After these incidents, I made the decision to walk the walker or use human support when I read the house. On my worst days, I felt fatigued, weak, non-motivated, and sick. The non-motivation affects my life by making me depressed. I don't have the energy. <laughs> to complete my normal activities. That's when I use as much human support as needed with walking, getting dressed, and showering. On the, these days, I normally don't do as many activities such as doing my makeup, house chores, or soaking up the sun. In the future, my biggest concerns for my life are worrying about having human help in my activities of daily living and the progression of the condition. 
It's my heart's desire to find a cure for SCA too. It will take lots of determination from patients, doctors, and researchers to find a cure. A medication to slow the progression is currently being tested. I'm blessed to be a participant in this study. I will not give up. I will continue to fight. Hello, my name is Gina Logan, and I have been diagnosed with SCA3. I knew I suffered from this affliction before I was diagnosed by, non by my neurologist. You see, this was inherited from my father, who inherited it from his mother, who inherited it from her father, along with five of her siblings. I first noticed something was off with my balance around the age of 44. I am now 50. It is hard for me to discuss because it seems my symptoms are coming on fast. At first, I tried to pretend it was from a broken ankle I suffered the year before, but with my family history, I knew better. Living with the taxi presents different challenges every day. When I first started writing this, I was on, I was in bed with a brace on my right ankle, not from the one that was previously broken, and a brace on my left knee. Walking was almost impossible and extremely painful. I didn't know if this, was, if this was the beginning to the end of my independence. I also have trouble getting up off my sofa, and sometimes I have a hard time getting out of the tub. I have plenty of family. They are 100 miles away. They want me to move closer so they can take care of me. I have been a caregiver for my father, and I would rather end my life than to have to depend on someone to attend to my every need from feeding, bathing, and other needs. The scariest thing about falling is you never know when it is going to happen. And I can't even tell family, doctor, or physical therapist what happened. All I, I'll ask if I felt dizzy, and the answer is always the same. No. Ataxia is not about feeling dizzy. It is about my legs not wanting to work correctly, or crazy legs. I even make light of some of the falls I've had by saying I was air walking. Those are falls when I don't know if my feet even touch the ground. I try my best to make others feel at ease with my affliction while I'm really crying on the inside. I lost my balance and crashed into the wall at work. Some laughed and asked me what I had been drinking. That was really embarrassing and hurtful. I'm afraid to have a glass of wine when having dinner with friends because my condition is not familiar to most and I could never pass a sobriety test, even if I had had nothing to drink. I can no longer dance at celebrations, my handwriting has gotten terrible, and I have given away most of my heels. I hate the looks of pity I receive. Watching from the sidelines is no fun. I can't walk with the stairs without assistance. I would love to take walks outside, but I'm afraid of falling with no one to help me. I only have one friend that I can take walks with who I'm comfortable enough with to take walks with and she is not always available. I would love to go to the gym to exercise. However, I have fallen twice in the gym and I'm afraid I will be too tired for my legs to carry me home. I feel like I am losing my independence. The other day I was walking across the front in the Kroger, my second job, and the next thing I knew, I was down on my knees. It was a struggle to get up because the muscles in my legs were weak. When I fall outside, it is even worse. There's usually nothing to pull up on to help me up. Once my legs are comfortable for no longer than 30 minutes, they become super heavy. It takes me 45 minutes to get to my first job. Once I get there, it takes me another five minutes to get stable enough to get out of the car to be able to walk into work. I feel rigor mortis is set in. My legs feel like they weigh 100 pounds each. It is embarrassing and sometimes emotionally draining. I live alone, divorced, and no children. I often wonder how long it would take for someone to notice I am hurt or worse, dead. I often tell my bookends because I am the middle child and I have an older brother and a younger brother that I will turn to dust and be swept away by a vacuum before anyone notices.
I have given up on ever finding anyone to be a life partner with because I hate explaining my condition and they never understand. I'm participating in a medical study now. I am not hopeful for a cure, even though it would be wonderful. I am just wanting to stop the progression. Hi, my name is Jason. I have SA7 and I'm from New York City. Hi, my name is Sherry. I'm a native of Nashville, Tennessee. Jason and I recently relocated to Arizona. We've been married 25 years and living with ataxia for 20 years. During those 20 years, we've had four family members diagnosed and three have died. Jason's mother, Diane, was properly diagnosed at age 55. She passed away in 2015 at age 69. Our firstborn, Jordan, was diagnosed at age two. He passed away at age three in 2002. Our surviving child, Sydney, started showing symptoms at four and a half and passed away at age eight in 2009. Jordan started walking at 12 months. However, when he was about 14 months, I noticed he wasn't mastering walking. He seemed to be doing worse because he kept falling and couldn't seem to keep his balance. At this time, he had frequent falls daily and would not brace for the impact or protect himself when he fell. So he busted his lip, it seemed, every day. He walked with a wide gait and constantly drooled. His pediatrician eventually referred us to a pediatric neurologist who diagnosed Jordan with ataxia. During the next 15 months, we watched Jordan go from walking to crawling to being bedridden. He went from saying a few words to being nonverbal. He required a feeding tube and lost his eyesight. It seemed we were adjusting to a new normal every two to three months during this time. When Jordan was diagnosed, I was already pregnant with Sydney. While Sydney seemed to be fine for several years, she began falling at four and a half. Having gait issues, walking with the wide stance and balance issues, very unsteady. We started to notice her holding on to things to balance herself. She, should, she would also hold the hand of a friend for assistance. Sydney would eventually go from walking independently to using a gait trainer to a wheelchair, then being bedridden. She too required a feeding tube, became nonverbal, and lost her eyesight. This all progressed over a period of four years. I first noticed a problem. In 2003, I was 32 years old, and I had forgotten something, so I ran to get it. I quickly noticed my movement was not fluid. I ran track in high school, so this feeling was foreign to me. This was my first recollection that something was wrong. Looking back, I can say that this was when I started showing mild symptoms. As the disease progressed, I started holding Sherry's hand to balance myself. Balance myself when we were out in public. This was about six years after the running incident. During that period of time, I began to feel clumsy and my coordination and gait seemed off. After holding Sherry's hand for two years, I eventually got a walker and have been using it for nine years. I use a manual wheelchair outside the house. In 2010, I noticed a major change in my vision, which is a symptom of SA7. The bifocals I had no longer corrected or improved my vision. My depth perception wasn't good. So not being able to judge narrow spaces, I could not opt for a motorized wheelchair that would allow me more independence. Not being able to do for myself can be very frustrating. Jason experiences tightness in his lower back muscles when sitting or sleeping without firm support. He's learned exercise is imperative as his ataxia progresses. Muscle spasms can have him in bed, unable to do anything, sometimes for three to seven days. Falls can happen very quickly and without warning. 
Jason knows if he's not focused when transferring to the bed, shower, or car, he will surely fall. Another major concern of Jason's is not being able to perform his job for as long as he would have if it were not for the ataxia. Due to muscle and mental fatigue, he must take a nap during the day to complete the second half of his workday. The tasks that demand mental sharpness must be done at the beginning of the day. With Jason's vision and speech challenges, as well as muscle and mental fatigue, he will probably have to retire soon. Wow, truly incredible, incredible stories and you know, just incredible people. You know, it's not easy to do what they did and, and put together and think and share with us all of those experiences. So thank you to each and every one of, the, of you who were a panelist uh, uh, on that panel talking about ataxia and other neuromuscular as uh, impacts of these conditions. Um, we now have another panel that we would like to introduce that we're going to be speaking to the non-neuromuscular impacts. So you'll be hearing about things like uh, visual problems, sp uh, speech, swallowing, memory and dementia, even ep epilepsy and behavioral issues. So uh, listen close. We've got a great panel with Tom, Cameron, Christy, and Jeanette. Tom, take it away. My name is Tom Sweeney. I've FCA one I live in Hopkins, Minnesota, and three of the seven children in my family have inherited the disease. I was diagnosed in 2008 and at the age of 51 years old. My speech is why I have been a fairly per it been severely affected as progression continues. Choking is a common occurrence. When speaking, it's hard to form words and sentences. These combination have caused my early retirement from my career in teaching. Losing my ability to be in a classroom is the most difficult consequence to accept. Recently, using the phone has become increasingly difficult. It's a challenge for me to simultaneously hold the phone and form coherent sentences. When my speech is not understood, the speed, the speed at which I speak slows down Tremendously. Another side effect is the difficulty in controlling my voice. My word retrieval function is slow and continue to progress. This is one of my bad. This is exemplified by my beginning conversations with the words like mm, ah, and uh. Reaction, the reduction in word finding also makes it hard to pronounce words. People can lose interest very easily. Contributing my insight is very hard and I'm challenged in social gatherings. I talk so slow that I cannot interject thoughts quickly into conversations. One-on-one -on -one communication is good as long as the listener is patient. Consequently, I want to withdraw from interaction with others. Occupational physical therapies help, but they don't stop the progression of the disease. These type of therapies are merely bandages. My family has tried to be understanding and supportive. I'm, I'm not the only one living with the taxi in our house. Swallowing and choking on foods and solids, even saliva, can cause uncontrollable fits of coughing up to 15 minutes in length 
leaving me exhausted and scared. Eating more requires cutting my food into tiny pieces and chewing 20 to 30 times per bite. Textures contribute to my choking as well. Using a straw is a must. Helping reduce the incidence of choking. Clearly, my choking and coughing is scary for me and for any witnesses. And there is a lot of concern for my well-being. Uh, choking protocols never far from people's minds. There are emotional stakes with the ataxia. Losing control of my emotions is an ongoing challenge. My reactions can be unpredictable and irrational. Many times I find myself apologizing for something I can't control. I suffer from depression and isolation. I feel loneliness and general sadness due to the loss of certain skills and the ability to perform household repairs such as and activities of daily life. My name is Cameron Cobb and I'm 20 years old. At the time, I was a competitive swimmer and water polo player and I learned to play at the flute in third grade which I played until my condition no longer allowed it. One day in eighth grade, I felt lighted and my friends told me later that he had fainted and hit my head on a vending machine. The doctor told us I needed to rest and no activities. My balance was off and I was no longer able to walk in a straight line. When I walked, I found myself having to take a step a wide step to regain my composure. Throughout high school, I felt, felt like I was going to fall over all of the time. I no longer trusted my own legs. I started wearing ankle weights to help ground me. My coordination slowed and I couldn't take notes quickly in class. My voice was changing and people couldn't. understand what I was saying. I became frustrated that I had to constantly repeat myself. My official diagnosis of spinal cerebellar ataxia type 7 was confirmed in November of 2015. The simple things like walking became a challenge to the point. By my senior year, I needed an air to walk with me from class to class because there was a, there was a fear I might fall. 
my voice became vapored and my mouth wasn't keeping up with my breath. My coordination and vision became so bad I had to quit playing the flute. I was devastated. Now I'm in college and find it hard to take more than two classes at a time. I take slowly, I speak slowly, and I need accommodation with taking tests. Teachers have to print my handouts and test a larger font so I can keep up. Someone has to drive me to college and we'll move into a class. I haven't had a normal existence since my diagnosis. I'm not taking college classes this fall semester because evening is too hard for me. I hate ataxia and have been patiently waiting for medicine that will allow me to have my independence again. Living with ataxia is a nightmare. I am trapped in a body I can't control. My name is Christy Bundukamara. I'm the caregiver of three family members with DRPLA. My husband's presentation is typical of DRPLA ataxia presentation. I would like to take you through the symptom presentation of my children. First, meet my son, Reggie. When Reggie was four years old, we first saw that he was having difficulty sitting still. He wasn't progressing in his speech. By age five, Reggie was not improving. He was unable to learn new skills, such as his alphabet, counting, and by age six, he was reevaluated and his IQ had dropped from 86 to 70. Within a year, he began with drop seizures and his first generalized seizure was in 2006. These seizures did not respond typically to medications and were significantly difficult to control. By the time Reggie was nine, he had intractable epilepsy and post-ictaly, he became ataxic. And that's when they did the ataxia genetic panel and found the DRPLA. Reggie maintained physical development and was able to walk, ride a bike, swim. His cognitive ability, however, stagnated at three years old. The last IQ testing we did, his IQ came out at 52. His seizures were never controlled and we were on a clear cycle of two good days, often without sleep, and then he would go into a severe cluster of generalized myoclonic and tonic-clonic seizures. He usually had six to 12 seizures in a 24-hour period and did not function at all during that time. By the age of 13, Reggie began to regress. He was progressively using less words and progressively needing a wheelchair more days. His ataxia was obvious with multiple falls and injuries. At the age of 15, Reggie had several significant setbacks, escalating dystonia, two traumatic femur fractures in the middle of a tonic-clonic seizure. His regression continued with no walking and minimal speech. He stopped speaking and we were losing hope. Reggie started using an eye gaze and we knew he was still in there because he could tell us how he felt and what he wanted. On October 30th, 2016, Reggie appeared sick, but there was no real indication it was serious. But at 10.30 that night, he was starting having difficulty breathing. I called 911, but by the time rescue arrived, Reggie went into respiratory and cardiac arrest. My son died that day. Now meet my daughter. Her name is Maya. 
And although her presentation is significantly slower, it is progressing just like Reggie. The MRIs are showing progressive atrophy as with Reggie and my husband. When Maya was five years old, she had absolutely normal development and her IQ testing was 90. She participated in competitive gymnastics. However, within a few years, her gymnastics coach said that she wasn't progressing like the other kids. Her school said she wasn't keeping up. We did tutoring and changed schools, but it was becoming evident that there might be something wrong. Maya continued to struggle in school and stopped doing gymnastics. We had her IQ tested again and it came out at 69. At age 11, she started with tonic-clonic seizures. Medication be started to become ineffective. Even though she was 14, Maya's academic grade level was at second or third grade and her verbal uh, skills and reading skills were very low. We continued to have problems controlling her seizures. In a 24-hour EEG, she would have over 300 generalized myoclonic seizures. It is devastating to watch your child continue to get worse and to watch these seizures. By the age of 16, Maya had progressed to having immune dysregulation, cognitive decline, emotional dysregulation, severe sleep apnea, exercise-induced asthma, which during a tonic-clonic seizure would, would exacerbate and she could not breathe. Maya is currently 20 years old and the progression is obvious. She's only using three to four words in a sentence. Her processing speed has significantly declined. The ataxia is evident as she holds on to things when she changes positions. Of all the symptoms that my daughter has, I just wish that she could take care of herself again. We have to help her get dressed. We have to help her go to the bathroom. I remember when she was completely normal. You can imagine how Derpla impacts our lives. Best or worst days doesn't really matter. Consistent progression of Derpla is living a slow and painful life of grief. Grief of the loss of normal, anticipatory grief of the next loss, and ultimately grief and likely death. My biggest fear is that no one will try to find a treatment or a cure because there's not enough people diagnosed. My name is Jeanette Viveros. I am 35 years old and I have spinocerebellar ataxia type 3 which is more commonly known as Machado Joseph disease. My symptoms first began nine years ago when I started having issues with my balance. Knowing my father's family suffered from Machado Joseph disease, I had hoped it wouldn't surface until later in life if at all. I had accepted the idea that this may become my future fate, but I had assumed I'd have already done everything any normal adult would have accomplished in their life and never truly understood the severity of the disease. I never fully understood that my speech, swallowing, and vision could be affected. And unfortunately for me, my condition has progressively worsened. I tried to hide my symptoms as best as I could in the beginning. But when I was confronted at work, and was told people had noticed something was wrong. This was when I finally came to germs with my disease, which was six years ago. One of the things I had wished to accomplish was having a child and raising it with my husband. We tried IVF with PGD on two separate occasions with no positive result. This was pretty devastating news 
but now we are acclimating living life as fur parents to our dog, Teddy. My husband, Matt, has always been very understanding, supportive, and patient regarding my condition. I was very embarrassed to be seen in public with my drunken gait, assistive devices such as a cane, rollator, or scooter. My slurred speech makes me feel like I have a fat, lazy tongue. Everything sounds great in my head but it doesn't always come out clear and concise. I still feel self-conscious when going out with friends. I don't speak too often because I am slow and somewhat slurred, especially at the end of the day. I once was an extreme extrovert, talking to anyone and everyone. But this disease has changed my personality to a quiet introvert. I do worry that I'll lose touch with friends, but so far, the friends who care Make sure I am always involved. I am embarrassed with choking in public. Also concerned with choking when I am alone. When eating or drinking, I tend to choke and cough incessantly, bringing a lot of concerned attention my way. I sometimes cough so much from choking that I vomit. So I try to carry a barf bag with me at all times, just in case. I am fearful of what might happen if I choke while I am home alone and I am unable to get help. When reading the computer, my phone, or physical print, I sometimes have trouble focusing and need to close one eye to see and focus properly. I have a bachelor's degree in business marketing and am an intelligent woman However, my slow and slurred speech makes me feel that I do not portray myself as such. Sometimes I fall into a dark place, wondering what my purpose is, but I make every effort to not stay there. It would be too easy to stay. Wow, another incredible panel. Um, so much, uh, you know, to, to process there and think about. And I just want to, you know, thank each and every one of you for taking the time and sharing today. And we, uh, you know, are now getting into the point of the agenda where we're going to broaden the conversation. And we want all of you that have uh, been tuning in live, this is where we're gonna want you to call in and, and write in with your, your, your feedback and your experiences. And um, looking at these questions here, um, kind of spoke to these topics a little bit earlier, but really focusing again on the disease, direct disease symptoms, those things having the greatest impact on you and your daily life and your quality of life and trying to understand um, what that actually looks like, you know, what that feels like, what that means to you. Um, so if you uh, have a, a disease experience, a symptom uh, 
that you've experienced and you want to share how that's impacted your life, we encourage you to call in. That phone number is 1-703-844-3231. Again, that's 1-703-844-3231. Um, you can also write in using that uh, comment uh, box that is under the live stream here today. But to get us started on this topic and, and bring everyone into the fold, we have a couple of polling questions that we want to uh, do with you. So please pull back out that cell phone, open that browser, uh, that tab maybe that you had open. If you joined us and you weren't able to join for the first set of polling questions, go ahead and type in that uh, URL you see listed at the top of the screen, pollev.com forward slash ataxia. You'll be able to follow along these polling questions the rest of today. So these first couple questions that we have, we just want to get a sense of, in this first one, what are the different uh, ataxia-related health effects um, that you, or if you're a caregiver, the person that you care for, your loved one, that they either have now or have had in the past? So any, any symptom or health effect, whether it's a current one or something that's been experienced in the past, please select all that apply. Um, bear with me as I, I uh, go through this list. There's a lot to consider. Um, a, impaired mobility. B, poor muscle tone or muscle wasting. C, muscle stiffness, such as spasticity, rigidity, and dystonia. D, a lack of balance. E, decreased coordination and fine motor skills in the arms or hands. F, uncontrollable live, limb movement. G, numbness and tingling. H, seizures. I, speech or swallowing difficulties. J, fatigue or sleep difficulties. K, visual impairment, such as uh, weak eye muscles and eye movement disorders. L, cognitive impairment or intellectual disability. M, depression or anxiety. Or N, some other or symptom, uh, symptom or health effect of your condition uh, that's not reflected here on this slide. We want to know about those things even if they aren't uh, listed here. One thing I want to point out is, um, unlike the previous polling questions, when you see the percentages on this slide, this is because of uh, any question we see today where our respondents can select more than one response. So here you can select all that apply. We're seeing percentages of total responses. So uh, if you're looking at impaired mobility, it's 12%. That doesn't mean that only 12% of people are picking that. It's 12% of our total responses. Um, so we'll be able to go back later and break it down in terms of, of people, but that's just what we're seeing today. And what we're seeing today here is that uh, there's a, a wide range of different symptoms and health effects that are being experienced. And you can kind of think of the bars almost as a little bit of like a ranking. So the ones most experienced are the impaired mobility and lack of balance. Perhaps after that, it's the, the uh, decreased coordination and fine motor skills in the arms and hands, as well as speech and swallowing difficulties. Um, close behind are the muscle stiffness, the uh, poor muscle tone and muscle wasting, and fatigue and sleep difficulties. And we're seeing really uh, responses with experience across all of these. Maybe one of the more rare uh, uh, symptoms being seizures. And we do have people reporting some other symptoms that aren't listed. So um, we're uh, shortly going to be going to the phones and, and written comments. And so uh, we'd love to hear your experiences with any of these symptoms. And if you uh, reported other, we'd like to know what those were too. Absolutely. I think we're seeing, I mean, People are reporting all of those symptoms that Dr. Wilmot talked about yeah. in his presentation uh, across the board. Yeah. So you all are the experts in these, so we need to hear from you. If we go to our second polling question, you'll notice um, in this that the response options are very you know, familiar. They're just actually exactly the same as the last. Here we want you, though, to only pick the, the top three most troublesome of those symptoms in terms of how they've affected you as an individual. So. Um, if, if you're a person living with uh, an SCA or DRPLA, which of these three uh, has had the greatest impact on your life? If you're a caregiver, which of these three have had the greatest impact on your loved one's life? Um, so this one, uh, uh, you're familiar with what the response options are, but do a little bit of thinking and let us know which ones um, are most troublesome for you. These are some of the things we saw from in the uh, in the presentations that we just, we just saw. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so um, while you're thinking and while responses are coming in, it's looking like um, again this is percentages of, of responses. So it's looking like the top 
of the top threes is uh, lack of balance having uh, the greatest impact on people's life, um, followed by uh, impaired mobility, and maybe number three being the speech and swallowing difficulty. So uh, kind of a, a clear top three emerging, um, you know, maybe the fourth in the ranking being decreased coordination and fine motor skills in the arms and hands. Uh, we heard about that also in yep. the panels. Um, but I think importantly, almost uh, n uh, the only one with nobody saying it's a top three, so truly most troublesome to them being the depression or anxiety, but every other symptom we have lift listed here for somebody is in their top three and for many people uh, for, for several of these. So um, we want to hear uh, as we move now to the audience discussion why it is that you pick this as your top three. So, you know, we want to uh, understand um, what it is that, that these symptoms have meant and how they've impacted your lives. I'd like to welcome our Zoom panel. As I mentioned, we're, we have um, some members of your community here that are have joined us by Zoom, uh, individuals living with the ataxias or, and uh, caregivers. Um, I want to remind you now, if you want to share, you know, you just did those polling questions, why did you pick what you picked? You can call in um, 1703-844-3231. That number, you can always look on the web page you're on now, find that number and call in at any time. To get us started here today, I'd like to um, you know, maybe start with Jody um, and ask, you know, when you were responding to that polling question and picking you know, which things were most troublesome, you know, wh what were you thinking? What did you pick? Why? Well, um, I mean, at this point in my life, I mean, definitely the balance is an issue. I mean, I, um, you know, can only go out during the day when I can see everything mm -hmm. clearly and um, avoid curbs. And, you know, another thing is the swallowing issues. And I choke every single day on just water. I mean, um, so I'm dealing with that. Um, I think my other, the other thing I put was that, um, you know, just impaired mobility. I mean, just getting around is always a problem. Sure. And maybe yeah. relative, or is it that these are kind of the, the three main things that you experience or do you experience many other of those symptoms um, that were listed there, there as well. Um, yeah, some other things too. Um, definitely fatigue is always an issue. Um, I have, um, I don't know if this was listed, but I also have tremors. I have tremors in my head, um, and my, my fingers and hands, um, yeah, so Jody, thinking about, I think going back to your number one, at least you started off saying um, uh, kind of, um, you know, coordination, balance um, was was a top for you. Can you give an example of how that's, um, you know, had a, been troublesome for you or, or had an impact in your daily life? Well, um, you know, uh, I use a walker when I go in an airport, but Fortunately, to this point, I can still walk, but I walk, you know, I can't worry about what people think about me because, you know, a lot of people think I've been drinking. I mean, I, I look like a person that's intoxicated mm -hmm. and, um, you know, so I've learned not to worry about what people think. Sure. Well, thank you so much, Jody. I want to, you know, maybe go to Paul. Paul, for, you know, a, as a caregiver, you know, how, how were you thinking about that question and, and what did, you know, maybe you can give us some insights into what you picked and why. Thanks, James. Um, just by way of background, my son, uh, who was 14, suffers from DRPLA. And I think from a symptoms perspective, 
the thing that is probably most affronting the physical uh, symptoms would absolutely be seizures, um, uh, where um, he has grand mild seizures. And then secondly, the deterioration in his speech and the slurring in his speech. But probably the, the sort of the darkest thing that's happening is the cognitive decline that, mm. that he is uh, experiencing and the dramatic drop in his IQ over time. Can you describe for us a little bit, of Paul, that, that cognitive decline? What does that look like? How do you notice it in, in day-to-day life? Yeah, so he um, has been going to school um, uh, throughout, but he really has not progressed since he was um, about six. So, um, you know, his ability to read books that he could read at one time, he can no longer read puzzles that he could do at one time, he can no longer complete. Um, You know, one of the challenges of, you know, having an iPhone with videos of your child is you can see how clearly he could participate in games and speak. And mm. when you see him today, you see a dramatic decline in those uh, abilities. Sure. Um, and does is the what does that that impact have on on him personally? Is there any frustration? Anything that you know, um, as as he experiences th- these symptoms, how would you describe what maybe bo- bothers or troubles him personally? Yeah, so look, I think, you know, sort of how much he's aware of the decline is unclear, and it's unclear, it's difficult to sort of talk to him about it and really extract how much he observes it, but but I get a sense that he has a real sadness, um, and I see him watching his brother do things that he used to do at one time, and and you see a real sadness in his eyes that he, he knows that at one time he could do that, he can't now, and he, I think probably what makes him saddest is he doesn't really understand why he can no longer do it. And uh, that's very, uh, very, very sad thing as a parent to watch that. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, you know, I, I see that we do have some written comments coming in, so I want to go to, to Andrew. And yeah. you know, anything to add to maybe any of the symptoms that we've heard about or, or, or maybe something new? Yeah, so the comments do keep rolling in. And here are a few regarding the difficulty with balance, which I think oh. was one of those top ones that we saw. And we do have a short clip that we'll play as well. Um, So here's a comment from someone living with SCA3. The symptoms that are the most significant in my daily living right now is the balance and gait, and those are related. Having been an educator for 20 years, I had to retire for my safety from falling all the time. Here's another comment from someone living with SCA7 who states the most disturbing aspect is falling. Mm. So why don't we, let's take a, a look at the clip of what this balance difficulty and fear of falling might look like. You can see here even navigating a familiar home hallway can be precarious for those living with ataxia. Yeah, even things maybe we take for granted like standing and sitting um, uh, impacted by uh, balance and and coordination as well. Um, so I want to keep uh, the conversation going here and, and you know, see uh, maybe if uh, there were some uh, different uh, symptoms picked by some of our other panelists here. Um, you know, so uh, maybe Robert, uh, what for you, is there any, uh, whether it's something someone, others, uh, someone already said or not, would love to hear what maybe are the most troublesome symptoms for you. Well, I have had derpolis since I was maybe 48, and I'm now 65, so I'm a veteran of this. And, you know, I think that part of the difficulty is, of course, remembering in my own mind of when I lost certain skills. And I'm able to, I think, as I look around, remember that Mm. kind of keenly, and that does make me alternately sad and kind of angry at myself at at certain times. Mm -hmm. I can remember certain details of when I lost my balance along the way and I have no balance remaining at all. So dealing with airports has gotten to be impossible for me. Mm -hmm. I can remember when I used to step on the stepladder to change a light bulb in the ceiling. 
And I tried that because I always done that kind of chore. And I couldn't even climb up the stepladder, you know, let alone reach up to the ceiling once I got on top of it. So, I mean, most of my later life has been consisting of losing these kind of household duties one at a time over the last 15 years or so. And I used to be a great runner. I ran the Philadelphia Marathon twice, and I ran the Half Marathon twice. And, of course, the idea that I could even approach doing that now uh, is something that I've lost that I was kind of keen about. So I think that I have memory intact, and I'm actually... uh, even though it's a kind of remote teaching arrangement right now, Mm -hmm. I'm still actively teaching because I can, apparently I don't think that I've lost my ability to remember long words, even though sometimes I substitute a kind of a Hemingway style of short words (laughs) for these longer academic Jargons, sure. which I think most of my students like anyway. Yeah. So, Robert, you spoke a lot about losses, and you've mentioned a number of those. Um, you know, maybe to put that in some context, kind of in in terms of you know timing of those. Can you just describe maybe you know uh, you're you said you're a veteran, you're very experienced. You know, was this you know? Can you like maybe share what that pro- your progression and those losses, where those were at various points in your life? Sure. I think that, like, the middle of my 1950s, of my 50s, was when a lot of this stuff happened. So it was a period in my life that I looked forward to achieving certain ends. And, of course, I inherited this disease from my mother, who died of it when she was 82. And, of course, I didn't passed through my 50s in a smooth manner because that's when I lost so many abilities and I'm having trouble speaking right now. Sure. And I think that I agree with a previous speaker that I'm, that I'm doing better at the early part of the day sure. rather than at night when I'm really kind of mm. beside this. And what I mostly do... Right now, I get around the house, not in a rollator or a walker, but I have a kind of electric cart. And that's what I get around on. And I actually then go into the living room and sometimes sit Mm. contentedly on the couch in my last three years in order to appear more self-possessed than I actually now am. Mm -hmm. So that word, (laughs) self-possessed, has come to mean a variety of slippages along the way. Mm -hmm. You bet. Thank you so much, Robert. That's incredibly insightful. And thank you for sharing with us uh, all your experience, as you, you said it. Um, would like to, you know, get a, a, another caregiver perspective on this and go to Laura and Devin. Um, and, you know, want to hear, you know, what symptom, symptoms, impacts are you seeing as most troublesome and why? Yes, thank you. Um, so this is for our daughter, Cameron. She's uh, 20 now. She has uh, SCA7. So similar to what's been shared so far, her gait, uh, her balance, uh, spasticity. Um, so it's affected her ability to walk. Um, and her her coordination uh, and and also as coordination her speech and as many people have talked about uh, her speech is better in the morning but as the day goes on it becomes more impaired and or slurred mm. and and I think also uh, the vision so for her um, I think the last time we went to the uh, doctor mm-hmm. about time which is it was steady but it has it has definitely been impacted over time for her so the past five years she's seen the decline in her vision 
Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, that's what we uh, are telling. That's what we, it's part of our norm on a daily basis is the vision, speech, uh, and gait and coordination. Yeah, and can you give give an example? You know, it could be multiple. You know, it may be that multiple of those things are um, impacting it. But what's an example of a way that that impacts her daily life? Is there, you know, um, you know, some activity in her life that is more limited or, or, you know, has had to change the way that she goes about doing it because of those symptoms? Yeah, I think the perfect example right now due to COVID is, um, excuse me, e-learning. So this semester, she's not comfortable taking classes online. Mm. Um, She prefers to be in a classroom. So she has that person next to her that, you know, she can ask a question or, you know, raise her hand and talk to the teacher directly. Um, it's hard for her to keep up with the materials. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, seeing the screen, if something was too small, you know, in an e-learning environment, is not ideal. Um, The teachers print things out for her in extra large font. So that would be difficult, you know, to navigate as well. So, you know, we just decided that she would take this semester off and I'm hoping next semester, you know, the college is a little different and they will allow some in-class learning because that will make a big difference for her. But Absolutely. the vision is a huge piece of every day for her. And by the end of the day, you know, her vision is very impaired and um, her speech is labored and she's very fatigued. Yeah. So that's interesting that you talk about it kind of gets harder or those symptoms worsen by kind of the end of the day. Is that something that's pretty normal and, and, you know, does it even vary? Are there like good days and bad days for her? They're pretty consistent days. You know, like, like I said, in the daytime, she's has more energy and she's easier. It's easy to understand her. Um, she does have good days and some days you're right. She can wake up and the whole day is, you know, everything's labored. Everything's harder to understand. Um, it's harder for her. Maybe she's, you know, her body is worn out. Um, So, yeah, there are good days and bad days, you know, but pretty consistent on starting off well. And by the end of the day, it's it's a little harder for her. Absolutely. Well, thank you both so much. Um, So I see we have a caller um, who has a a few different symptoms that I I think uh, she wants to share that are most bothersome. We have Lauren from Washington, D.C., who is representing uh, SCA 8. So I'd like to welcome Lauren. Are you with us? Hi, I am. Welcome. Uh, please do. Uh, I, I see you had a, a few different, uh, perhaps what are our most bothersome uh, symptoms. Um, why don't you share a little bit with us about those? Sure. Um, so I would say my top three slash four symptoms include coordination, uh, eye movement, and then muscle tone and mobility kind of go hand in hand for me. Okay. Um, I, I'll start with coordination. Um, Cameron uh, Cobb is one of my great friends. Um, so Laura, what Laura and Devin were speaking about also really resonates with uh, me. I'm a third-year law student in Washington, D.C., um, and with the, the e-learning, it has been uh, quite challenging. Um, I can't coordinate my hands and my fingers to work together. Um, so with this e-learning, I am essentially trying to coordinate typing notes on my computer, logging into different Zoom programs, all of our textbooks are on the computer. Um, so really navigating the coordination um, by what my, I am trying to, my brain is trying to tell my hands and my fingers what to do, but it seems like I kind of can't keep up with that, which mm. then just makes the coordination worse almost. I hit the wrong keys, for example. Mm-hmm. Um for, for eye movement, um, I mentioned I'm a student, um, and in law school, there's a lot of reading. So I also suffer for, from nystagmus um, and kind of bouncing eyes. So when I read, all of a sudden, my eyes will kind of jerk back and forth, um, and I will lose my place, essentially. So when I have a lot of reading, that's very difficult to kind of have to start a sentence all over again multiple times because I, I can't keep up. Um, where my place is if my eyes are kind of jerking back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, And then for muscle tone and mobility, a lot of my mobility issues are because of my uh, dystonia and spasticity in my legs. Um, So I I wear bilateral AFOs. So as opposed to being able to just 
walk down the street, hop on the metro, et cetera. I really have to to plan out, okay, I can't go down this stretch of sidewalk because I know they did uh, work there recently and it's really uneven. Mm -hmm. Or uh, the escalator is down on the metro. I now need to go find an elevator. Um, And similar to what Laura was describing, um, I do as well get really fatigued by the end of the day. So when it's 6 o'clock at night and I'm trying to get home from school, um, this is even more challenging to try to navigate uh, because of my muscle tone um, and therefore my impaired mobility, so to speak. Sure. I mean, uh, incredible, you know, uh, examples that you shared there for each of those uh, very kind of illustrating, you know, clearly what those are doing for you. And, and, you know, given that you're a third year law student, congratulations with that. I think you're, it's all downhill, (laughs) downhill after year one. I've been been there too. Um, But uh, would love to know, um, you know, uh, on a given day, you know, are there, are there, you know, days where it's even worse than what you described? Or is that kind of, you know, uh, pretty consistent in your experience? So I would say that's kind of um, my baseline. I okay. certainly do have days where it is worse. Um, and I, off the top of my head, I can't really think of any specific factors as to why it would be worse other than um, if I don't get enough sleep the night before, I find myself needing at least 12 hours of sleep for me to function normally. Um, so with school, that's been very difficult. And if for whatever reason I get less than that amount of sleep, um, I just find it overall more challenging to control my entire body. Sure. Wow. Thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, really, you know, thank you for calling in. I want to keep encouraging others to call in. Um, that number, again, is one seven zero three eight four four three two three one. 844 know, We've heard now about a number of different um, uh, symptoms here, so I want to check to see what yeah. we're hearing from the, the written comments. Yeah, well, so, James, as, as Lauren talked about, the term nystagmus or kind of slow eye tracking mm-hmm. is something we've been getting comments on. Um, and I do think we have a clip to show you all as well coming up on that. Um, so uh, this is a from a caregiver of someone with SCA3. There is nothing to be done about the slow eye tracking, but it's worth mentioning as a symptom, not, not that he notices, but that I notice. It often looks like he is blankly looking at you if he has to turn his head to look at you when you speak. Mm. Once his eyes and then vision uh, and perception catch up, then all is well again. It's an emotionally draining symptom that I have not told him about because I fear um, what it will do to him. Mm-hmm. Um, so why don't we, again, I think we have a short clip to kind of show that that eye tracking issue that I think many, uh, many people with ataxia suffer from. Why don't we go ahead and play that clip? You can see the repetitive uncontrolled movements in the eyes and these movements often result in reduced vision, which I think the Cobbs talked about, and depth perception and can affect balance and coordination. As you saw, they can occur from kind of side to side, up and down, or in a circular pattern. So I think that was a kind of a good demonstration of what that, what that looks like for people. Absolutely. Um, so we uh, have a, another caller, uh, Chandra from Georgia, representing SCA3. Uh, we'd love to hear from you about your uh, most troublesome uh, symptoms. Uh, Chandra, are you with us? Chandra, are you with us? Not that's okay. Uh, we can come back to you if we can can get you back on the line there. So um, going to our, our Zoom panel, I uh, want to kind of uh, uh, complete complete the discussion with uh, the our, the five of you. So want to uh, put this to Dana. Um, you know, there's been a lot that's been talked about. You know, uh, what what specifically would you describe as being most troublesome? Well, since everyone else kind of. Um, you know, took, I'll just quickly say that like the lack of mobility is, is really hard for me um, because I'm, you know, very active and it's a lot harder for me to like get out and do yard work and just do like some basic things. Um, I live in a house, so there's 
cleaning and dishes and cooking and yard work, you know, and all. And, and so um, over time, it's difficult to think it how much harder it is today to do those things. Or, you know, some things I can't do anymore, like Robert mentioned um, changing a light bulb. Mm. I could not, I can't even, that, there's no way I can do that. And that's, to me, like a pretty basic household chore. Um, I think probably the one, th- a couple of things I haven't heard from other people that, I, you know, it's just worth mentioning is that um, I've had depression my whole life. Um, and <laughs> the combination of depression and ataxia is, is um, pretty overwhelming. And uh, I know it's probably um, fairly common not just in the general population, but um, I know that it it makes dealing with the symptoms of ataxia, you know, even harder to to kind of bounce back from. Right. Yeah. No. And the mental the mental health considerations are one we haven't heard a lot of people speak to, but we did see show up in those polling questions. So, Dana, thank you so much for. For speaking to that. Um, I do think we have our, our caller, uh, Chandra, back. So I want to uh, go to her and, and again from Georgia representing SCA3, um, have her share what were the, the top impacts from her perspective. Uh, Chandra, are you with us? Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Okay, I was 43 when I started having my symptoms and I was diagnosed at 46. And I'm 51 now, mm. and I had to retire from uh, being a teacher. But but some symptoms that I have is dizziness, because when I lay, I can't lay my head back without getting dizzy, and then I can't lift my arms up without getting dizzy. So those mm. are kind of different. But I do have the uh, I use a walker every day for balance for balance, for keeping my uh, balance under control. Mm-hmm. But the dizziness is the, uh, it's really what I'm concerned about. And I've had two family members, two sisters that have passed mm-hmm. from this condition. I mean, they could, they were big, but buried. And I have a nephew now that's in the nursing home, and he can't walk. So I'm not claiming I'm not claiming the uh, non walkiness, but I can deal with everything else. But I'm like, because the neurologist told me that I was going to end up in a wheelchair soon. Wow. But I'm not claiming all that. <laughs> yeah, and has that that dizziness? I mean, this is you know I'm, I'm glad you called in. We uh, something else we haven't heard a lot about. Um, you know, is, is this something that's kind of there all day, or does it kind of onset? Or, or become worse at different parts of the day? You know, is there anything that you can, well, is it predictable? It's just, it's just when I hold my head back to go to sleep or something. Okay. It's when I lay my head back in a, in a uh, back position. And when I lift my arms up over my head, mm-hmm. sometimes I get dizzy. Absolutely. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Sandra, for, for you know, sharing that Um really added to the conversation. I want to uh, throw it one more time to Andrew yeah. on, before we move into our next discussion question, uh, see what, what else on symptoms. I just want to cover a couple of things. So um, Chandra just brought up dizziness. Um, we have a comment here from Macy from Texas living with SCA1. She comments that my mother and I have SCA1. Our top three items with the most impact daily are dizziness all the time, swallowing issues, which I think several people have brought up, involving choking and tiredness or fatigue. The dizziness is the one part that will not fade. It is not a vertigo type feeling, but rather like you are standing in a fun house or playground on a wobbly bridge that is only connected at the ends. Boy, I think that is such a powerful way of describing what that must be like. This is how my mother explains it, um, Macy said. So I thought that was 
powerful. And then I did want to come back to uh, just a little bit of uh, the gate um, and sort of balance issues that I think are are somewhat related. Sure. Um, so um, let me find the right uh, quote here. Um, so uh, Sandy, who's living with SCA7, says, balance on any uneven surface is zero and I will fall without support. And I think we, are gonna, we have a clip uh, about uh, the gate as well that I think will, will, will help people understand this. She says, going anywhere alone is scary mm -hmm. and I limit those few occasions. Um, I think we heard from Lauren uh, earlier about those uneven surfaces and how difficult that can be uh, to walk down. So I think we have a, uh, a clip on, on gate. Why don't, we, uh, why don't we go ahead and play that now? You can see, obviously, the unsteady kind of staggering nature of gait, right, for someone with ataxia. And, and as someone brought up earlier, and this is really kind of a tragic uh, uh, part of this, this can often be perceived as being un uncoordinated or obviously even drunk. Mm -hmm. And I think that is something that ataxians have to deal with all the time that just is really uh, kind of an unfair part of all of this. Absolutely. Um, so we've kind of already got into this. This is related, but you know, I want to probe a little bit on uh, with all of you that are, are with us today on what activities have been impacted um, by these symptoms of your your ataxia. Um, we've heard you know some examples that relate to this, but we really want to know you know what of the things that are are important to you. Um, you know, have are you either not able to do it all anymore, or maybe not as fully because of these symptoms? And it might be because of multiple of these of these symptoms. Um, but to get us started on this, we have another polling question for you. So we're going to go to um, you know pull those phones back out, go to that tab, go to pollev.com forward slash ataxia, and we have a question um, about what specific activities of daily life that are important to you. Are you not able to do, or do, uh, or you have difficulty doing because of your condition? And here again, select the top three. So, which uh, activities that are important to you have been uh, most affected? Uh, so, your options are A, walking; B, attending school or working; C, personal hygiene and grooming; D, communication; E, driving a motor vehicle or community mobility; uh, F, participating in sports, exercise, or physical activities; G, performing household tasks or maintenance. H, participating in family or pet care. I, going out, socializing and traveling. J, sexual activity. K, eating. L, reading. M, meal preparation. Or N, some other activity that's important to you that you are unable to do or have difficulty doing because of your SCA or DRPLA. Um, again, please select the top three All right, so uh, as it stands, it looks like uh, that, again, this is more of ranking. This uh, is not the percentages of people, but by far the top most impacted activity in daily life is walking. Um, you know, so we really want to understand what that means. You know, act walking is an activity that can really, you know, impact many other, you know, specific activities. So we would love to hear from you about that. Um, short of that, and some of those uh, related things might be the what is number two in our, our ranking here, uh, participating in sports, exercise, and physical activities, followed closely by communication, going out socializing and traveling, and performing household tasks or maintenance, and, and attending school and working. So a lot of really important activities here that are impacted. And every single other activity on this list is being uh, noted as a top three most impacted um, uh, activity. So we want to hear those examples. We want to hear sto your stories from your lives of what this actually looks like um, in your life. So uh, we encourage you to call in 1703-844-3231 uh, uh, or write in. Again, you can use that comment feature that is right under the live, uh, the live stream of this on the web. Um, but I want to start with a caller. We have uh, Maya from the UK, uh, who is a caregiver to both her husband and son with DRPLA. Um, Maya, I'd love to hear from you. You know what uh, activities have been uh, most impacted, and, and what symptoms have been driving those um, for your your husband and son. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Maya. If you're with us, are you are you with us? Yes, Sam. Hi. Welcome. Um, 
Right. I wanted to say that um, depending on the time of the onset of the illness, um, I have seen my my husband who has a mid life onset, which is a much slower progression of the illness, and my son, our son, who has a very early onset, juvenile onset, which comes with epilepsy and various other difficulties. And the symptoms that are most important to each of them are different. Mm -hmm. So we talked a lot about gait and inability to walk and um, without support, and that is definitely the case with my husband. Okay. However, for my son, whose illness is a lot more aggressive and progressive, it's become very difficult for him to speak, and then you realize how important it is, our ability to communicate pain, um, our wishes, our, you know, when you end up with just being able to say yes or no, and uh, most people not being able to understand you, how crucial um, the ability to speak and communicate yeah. it is uh, within our society. So um, this is where I wanted to say the symptoms can be very, very different and their impact on our lives can be very, very different. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, thank you, Maya, for that. That's very uh, helpful to, to hear those different ways that these symptoms impact mm -hmm. you and your, your whole family's lives. Um, you know, I guess one question that I would have is, you know, as these um, symptoms have uh, progressed, um, you know, have you noticed that it's, you know, uh, the, the severity, you know, at, at, with the progression has limited di different certain activities? So, you know, uh, kind of social interaction kind of is a very broad um, activity. You know, have there been specific social interactions that have been more limited over time? Absolutely. With with our son, he was attending normal high school and um, was attending all the sporting activities and, and participating to the point where he now can't walk um, or, or without aid. And um, obviously, he has lost all of those um, um, participation abilities and the social aspect of it. And he has become very isolated from his peers. Mm -hmm. um, and even though he understands a lot, it's very hard for him to watch his siblings go swimming and go to play whatever sport. Mm -hmm. um, and he can't. And he desperately wants to. For my husband, it's slightly slower. So the progression is extreme, much, much slower. So he's, um, he's losing abilities to do certain things, but we don't actually notice them as much because it's not such a rapid loss. So over a period of time, you sort of adjust and accommodate um, to, to, to the way he walks or maybe doesn't speak as clearly as, as he would and we, we sort of all remind him to, to do things and to mm -hmm. try hard and to concentrate and speak slower and, and, and do various things. But we are obviously very concerned about his loss of um, employment because mm -hmm. um, um, he works as an accountant and he needs to be able to express himself and think clearly. Um, and um, obviously the physical side of not being able to uh, participate in sports and participate in physical activity then makes the symptoms come on a lot faster. Wow. Wow, so yeah. it is very, very important um, to keep as healthy as you can within your illness and to mm -hmm. seek any assistance, whether it's physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and try to keep yourself as healthy as you possibly can for as long as you possibly can. So I would encourage people to keep exercising, mm -hmm. keep reading to your children, read the newspapers out loud, try to use um, the facilities that you have and the abilities that you have uh, for as long as you possibly can. Yeah, no, thank you so much, Maya. I think it's really, you know, um, you know, uh, Dr. Brian talked about education and updating um, kind of his medical education. Um, you know, we heard Dr. Wilmot, you know, speak to this idea of, of loss is coming when you stop doing physical activity. So I'm glad you educated us uh, on 
uh, what that actually looks like and, and tr that fact that that truly does um, happen I think, in, in life. I think it's a theme we've seen through many of the comments that exercise is the one thing that, that makes people feel better about, yeah. about their lives. So yeah, right. absolutely. So, so exploring some additional uh, activities that are impacted uh, by the symptoms um, that we've already explored so much. Uh, I'm going to come back to our Zoom panel here and, and ask Jody uh, maybe if she can uh, share anything, you know, whether it's something we've talked about, but just how it impacts in your own life or, or, or something we haven't heard. Um, yes, I wanted to speak about um, my ability. The hamrot has greatly diminished. And so in order to fill out forms or things of that sort. I mean, the duty falls on my children who are busy teenagers and, and they don't, so I really need help with, um, you know, as a single mom, I mean, it's almost impossible to, to write. Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Jody. Um, I see you're nodding. Yeah. I so to... we, we actually have a clip on, on handwriting that we can show you all. I think that's that's I, several panelists have talked about a noticeable decline in their ability uh, to handwrite. And obviously, that's one of those fine motor skills that is affected by the ataxia. So why don't we go ahead and play that clip? Boy, James, you can see how difficult it is to keep the consistency needed. And I, I guess I would add, and, and we've heard from several of our panelists who have children who are either students or obviously those in the working world, I think that the handwriting is also relatable to the use of a, a, of a, of a computer. Um, so much time is spent having to type. Um, and you know, boy, the, fi the lost art of handwriting uh, these days. But I think that th that's a symptom that would also sort of carry over to the ability to use a, a computer. And obviously, there are assistive technologies that can help. Right. But it's as we heard from several, especially if you're a student trying to take notes and keep up, um, really difficult for those with ataxia. Sure. We heard about so many different activities being impacted as we were describing those symptoms. So. I think we have really uh, talked about you know many different of the, the real life, real world impacts of these symptoms. Um, you know, as we are, are coming kind of to our, our final part of this session, I have one final polling question for you. Um, I want to you know now kind of we, we've talked so much about what has been experienced, um, you know, both currently and in the past. Um, but we want to explore with you also about the future. And, and here we want to know what worries you most about your condition in the future. And we want you to select up to the, you know, select up to three. So select the top three things that you're most worried about. Um, and so again, this is uh, pull out your phones, open that tab uh, on your computer. Um, you know, these, as these, uh, we'll go going back to these polling questions throughout the whole day. Um, so here the options are A, not knowing how the disease will progress, B, losing independence, C, losing the ability to walk unassisted and becoming dependent on a mobility device, D, losing mobility entirely and being bed bound, E, having to move in, into an assisted living or skilled nur nursing facility, F, losing the ability to communicate, G, losing the ability to swallow, H, not having the energy to work and live as you want to, I, not knowing if you can support yourself and your family financially. J, becoming a burden to your family. K, not being able to afford your health care. L, not being able to care for your children. M, dying prematurely or N, other. I know this is very difficult uh, to, to probably weigh these things and think through these things. You know, uh, pick the, 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 you know, the top three that best represent you know, what most worries you. Um, because we want to be thinking not just about you know what a treatment could do for you now, but what also a treatment could could do for you um, in the future, and that's why this is so important. So again, you're seeing the percentages of to, of the responses. So this is essentially kind of a ranking of um, you know based off of the the bars that you see. Um, please, you know, we'll we'll give you a couple more minutes to think about this to get these responses in. You know, as it stands, it looks like we're, we're seeing, um, you know, a number that are, are towards the top of the list, um, perhaps number one, uh, although they're very close, being losing independence, um, also losing the ability to communicate being right up there, having to move into a assisted living or nursing facility, 
um, not knowing the, the uncertainty, the not knowing how the disease will progress, losing mobility and being bed bound and losing the ability to swallow. So uh, we're seeing, you know, uh, those maybe being kind of in the top tier, but we, we do see quite a few, uh, or actually all of these being uh, in somebody's and many people's top threes, including some others that aren't listed here. And so we definitely want to hear, have you call in, have you write in and share your worries. Um, and and to, to maybe get us started here, we actually have a caller. We have Ken from Michigan, uh, who represents SCA2, um, you know, that wants to talk about, um, you know, some of the, the fears that relate to the progressive nature of this disease. Um, so Ken, are you with us? Uh, uh, yes. Um, Welcome. Um, I have two concerns about my autoxia, and the first one is just knowing that uh, eventually um, I'll become a. It, it's progressive, and I'll, I'll become virtually a, like a vegetable. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, that, like sooner that June, that like gene suppression therapy um, comes about, like the better. Um, and I really hope uh, it's, it's soon before I lose all my abilities. And the second real, real concern is uh, my children and grandchildren. Um, like uh, SCA2 is, is hereditary. Mm -hmm. And uh, so um, like half of my children have SCA2. And right now we don't know which ones. But uh, with each generation... Um, um, SCA2, the uh, symptoms occur earlier, and uh, and listen to the callers. Um, they they get it seems like they get more severe too. So uh, I'm I'm very concerned, like uh, with uh, with with coming up with some kind of solution or some kind of kind of therapy or, or, or the gene suppression therapy. Um, I would like to have that become reality like sooner better than later yeah absolutely thank you, know. you yeah both both for yourself and and for the next generation really powerful thank you ken um maybe with a little wave a show of hands i want to see if our zoom panel here um if anybody would like to add something to this discussion of worries for the future what is it that uh most worries you about uh your future with ataxia paul why don't you get us started Um, James, um, you know, there's a lot that's not known about DRPLA and uh, the pace with which um, it, uh, it onsets. But I think what is very clear is if we do not find a cure for this disease, it will kill my son. Mm. Uh, and so we are very aggressively trying to develop a drug um, to save my son and many others who suffer from this disease, which is why days like today are so critical, which is why developing a very productive relationship with the FDA is, is just so uh, so critical. Um, and that's that's the journey that we're on. Well said, Paul. Yeah, well said. Uh, others on our, our Zoom panel um, want to add here. Yes, Robert. Oh, Robert, you're on mute. Still on mute. Okay. There, there we go. go. The, the thing that I lost the most of, at least for me at least, was the ability to read because I wasn't a, I still am, but when you work at a university, you read all the time and I can no longer read. I've tried all the magnifying classes that I can and it still doesn't really help. Mm -hmm. And one of the points is I wanted to tell Maya in Great Britain yes. that there's a really great dedicated uh, Derpola webpage that has a supervisor in the UK named Beth Orange. And maybe she should get on that page and communicate with some other people in the UK who have really been essential in helping to deal with preventing this disease in the future, working with Biohaven, et cetera, on new ways of yeah. helping people. 
Yeah. That's all yeah. I had. Information can be so powerful. Thank you, Robert, uh, for sharing that. And I think Devin, uh, Devin, you wanted to share. I see Dana. So we'll do Devin and then Dana uh, to close out our Zoom panel. Yeah, I think it's, it's a two part uh, about concerns for the future. Uh, two years ago at the National Taxi Conference in Las Vegas, our Dirty Cameron was able to actually speak to all the researchers. And for the researchers to put a face to people who, who live with uh, this condition, I think it had a huge impact. And so anytime you can put a face of our lives, of, of how this impacts us, uh, that's important. My wife has a second part. I guess the second part is, you know, she was diagnosed at 15. She's 20 now. Um, we're being told that this is dominantly inherited and we have never heard of it. Yeah. Um, you know, I've had conversations with Cameron about her future and, you know, you know, can I have children? Will I be, will I give them this disease? So just having to have those conversations is heartbreaking, right? Um, um, you know, she talks about adoption. So, you know, will she be able, she's has very limited capabilities around the house right now, would she actually be able to care for someone else? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, and especially if that's one of her hopes and dreams is to have children of her own. So those things, they keep me up at night. Wow. Thank you both. And Dana? <clears throat> yeah, I would, uh, the, one of the things that, <clears throat> As, as I progress and go along, um, the inability to communicate is really scary to me. Mm. Um, I know where I am right now, it's sometimes hard to speak clearly and to have others understand me. And I get frustrated at that sometimes. And if I think, you know, down the road a few years, you know, I really shudder to think that communicating is going to be greatly affected. And, um, and that's probably the thing that mm. worries me the most. Sure. Thank you. Well, I, I think we've covered so much ground in this first session here, and this won't be your last chance to participate today. It's only halfway. We're only halfway there. We still um, have so much to build on in the afternoon. And, um, hear about your treatment experiences and what has worked, maybe what hasn't, what are the downsides, and importantly, what you want from the future. And of course, tied to that is understanding um, your own disease experience, um, you know, to kind of put that into context. So if you wanted to share something about um, your, your experience, um, I encourage you to, to call in uh, in our next session, um, you know, and share that as part of that treatment discussion. Um, so with that, I'm going to I want to thank our, our Zoom panelists. I want to thank everybody that called in and wrote in for this first session. We are going to take a 30-minute lunch break here um, and come back at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, like I said, we'll be continuing the conversation, building on this, and really understanding um, your experiences with treatments. Um, so thank you all, and we will see you back shortly.
Hi there, this is James Valentine, and welcome back to the externally led patient focused drug development meeting on ataxias. Um, I know that our break was short for lunch, uh, so if you're at home, please feel free to continue uh, uh, munching away, and we're, but we're going to get back to the program here uh, in studio. Um, so as we come back from break, we actually want to start uh, with a video that we have that represents the life for many DRPLA families, and that it is common for a parent and a child to be ill at the same time, creating both a massive emotional and physical burden for the caregiver. Let's take a look. My husband, Chiaki, and I traveled around the world and made documentary shows. Kuri was born 10 years after we got married. She was a plump and cute girl. We moved to Hawaii when Kuri was six years old. At first, we had a simple life. But when she was eight years old, she had a big seizure and our life changed dramatically. Kuri suffered from these attacks and her cognitive abilities declined. She could no longer read the alphabet she had previously remembered. She couldn't keep up with her friends. Kuri repeatedly hit her hands and feet, crying. Why can't I do that? When Kuri became a junior high school student, she fell over and over again. I had another concern. My husband, Chiaki, who was kind, started getting angry and hitting me. 13 years ago, we knew the name of Chris disease, DRPLA. I was told that she might not be able to live until she became an adult. This disease is hereditary, and Chiaki also suffered from this disease. I knew that the change in personality was due to this disease. A doctor told me, his brain was melting. Am I losing my family? I cried, cried, and kept crying. With his illness, Chiaki couldn't control his emotions. I resented him because he kept yelling at Kuri and me. The pain of this illness is that even though the families love each other, we can't even live in peace. Still, we wanted to protect Kuri and make her feel happy. We took Kuri to hospitals in Japan and Houston. The two were steadily declining. Kuri has had severe sleep disorders for many years. Check his symptoms also progressed. I thought Kuri wouldn't leave until she graduated from high school, but she graduated with her friend. Chiaki could no longer feed himself, but thankfully, he returned to his own character and no longer yelled at us. He always said, I want to give my life to Kuri. I had no choice but to say it. Yes, to him. Three years ago, Kuri was hospitalized with sepsis and was in a serious condition. A few days later, Chiaki had an intracerebral hemorrhage and was taken to another hospital. Chiaki was connected to a respirator. I thought he went to help Kuri. Both symptoms were hopeless and I was told by both doctors on the same day, today is the last day. 
but Kuri was able to come back. Chiaki was not conscious, but he shed tears and showed a smile when I told him that Kuri was discharged. Then Chiaki passed away. Our life is very difficult. Thirteen years ago, we had no hope of medicine. But right now, there is hope nearby. Many families like us are waiting for a cure. We need all of your help. Never give up. Tomorrow will be a good day. We believe it. Thank you, Junko. Thank you for not only sharing your, your and your family's story, um, but also for sharing your hope and your hope for future treatments. Uh, and that is the perfect segue, I think, into our, our next, our second of two topics that we're going to address today. Um, so if we can see our uh, discussion questions for this second topic, uh, just to introduce what it is that we really want you all as experts um, in your experience to share with us um, on, and this is related to uh, your perspectives on current and future approaches to treatment. So what we're going to do in this uh, topic session is ask you to tell us about your treatments and other things you're doing to help manage your SCLA, SCA and DRPLA symptoms and disease. And when you think about treatments here, I don't want you to think just about medications, but of course we do want to hear about maybe symptomatic treatments that you're using, medical procedures. But think broadly, um, you know, what other types of therapies, whether PT or OT, um, or things that you do more holistically in your life, whether it's diet or exercise, or even lifestyle man uh, modifications, things that you just try to do in your life to make living with your condition or your loved one's condition a little bit easier. And so in exploring and hearing from you about what those different things are, we want to understand how effective have those treatments been for you or, or your loved one. Um, how well have they worked? How have you noticed that they've worked? Um, try to give, paint us a little picture of that. Um, but knowing that no treatment comes without some kind of trade-off, we also want to know what are the most significant downsides of those current treatments? And how do those downsides, whether that's a side effect, whether that's the burden of having to travel to a, a healthcare setting, uh, whatever you view the downsides and what they may be, how do they affect your daily life? Once we've explored current treatments, maybe things you've tried in the past, things you're currently using, we're then gonna, at the end of this session, look towards the future. And short of a complete cure for your ataxia, we wanna know from you what specific things would you want from an ideal treatment? Maybe another way to think about this is when considering a new treatment, what factors are important to you? Um, so to get us started on this topic, we have another great panel, members of your community, patients and caregivers. We have Carrie, Hannah, Jessica, Eric, Michelle, and Brett, who are going to share their treatment journeys. So Carrie, take it away. Hi, my name is Carrie Mackey, and I'm the mother of seven. My four youngest children all have DERPLA with juvenile onset. My oldest son, Aaron, is eight. My daughter, Shiloh, is seven. Samuel is six, and my youngest son, Joshua, is five. We adopted them when Aaron was three, and a short time later, we noticed he was having myoclonic jerking and some balance problems. He also had episodes where he would lose all muscle control in his neck, and his head would drop, or his legs would just collapse underneath him. He was diagnosed with DERPLA at the age of four. He had inherited it from his birth mother. We then started noticing the other kids having similar symptoms, and they were tested, and we found out that all three of the other kids also had DERPLA. I have been told by most doctors that there is nothing that they can do, and basically take them home and watch them die in not so many words. As a condolence, they would say, come back when the seizures start and we can treat those, but there's nothing else that we can treat. It was very disheartening. Over the last four years, we have watched Aaron slowly deteriorating. His myoclonus has become worse, and he now has ataxia, as well as some issues with verbal communication. He has episodes where he can't come up with the correct words to say to express his idea, 
or he completely forgets his thought in his sentence. This is very frustrating for him because he is so bright, but he can't communicate his thoughts appropriately. We have not been able to find any treatments to help with it at this point. Because of the myoclonic jerking, Aaron wakes up frequently at night. He rarely sleeps more than two to three hours. The doctor has prescribed multiple medications to try and help him. He is currently on three different drugs to help him sleep. He takes clonidine, doxepin, and trazodone and still only gets four to six hours a night. And even that is not consecutive hours of rest. The lack of sleep makes all the symptoms worse, especially the ataxia. Aaron's ataxia started about two years ago. We ended up having to get him a wheelchair with the neck support because he would tire out so quickly when we went places and he had trouble holding up his head. The physical therapist has worked with him, but because the issue is missing neural connections, it makes it very difficult. They give him exercises to do, but strength is not the issue, and they don't know when the neurons will misfire and cause him to stumble. Treatments center more on accommodation than on therapy to improve it. I've been told that there really aren't any medications that can help with the myoclonus or ataxia without risk of major side effects. I was told that they make him nauseated, very drowsy, and lethargic. And at this point, the benefits do not outweigh the risks, so we're forced to resort to the better of the two options, which is just to deal with it and make appropriate accommodations. He is very bright, but he struggles in school because his fine motor skills are so poor. He cannot form legible letters or numbers. The occupational therapist has worked with him on accommodations, like using number tiles to help him with math. He also has to type or dictate all of his writing for language arts because it is not able to physically write. Again, there is no treatments for this, and he just has to suffer through it and make the best of it. All of the kids have major behavioral issues and have to see a psychiatrist. Shiloh, my daughter, exhibits signs of ADHD, oppositional defiance, and behaviors on the autistic spectrum. She also has a lot of cognitive deficits due to the DERPLA and is in special ed for school. She is on guanfazine, risperidol, ambilify, and Adderall just to control her behaviors and keep her from going into uncontrollable rages. Shiloh is also on trazodone to help her sleep. The medications help the behaviors but she makes her drowsy during the day and awake all night. Trying to find a balance is a constant struggle because the way she metabolizes the meds changes frequently as the disease progresses and as she grows and changes. We know the disease can cause psychiatric problems and dementia in DERPLA patients. However, the disease is so rare and there's so little research, it is hard to know how much of the kid's behavior is related to the disease. Thankfully, none of my kids have started having seizures yet. I am, however, aware that they will start in a matter of time. This is a horrible disease, and I would love to see some kind of treatment that can help slow the process. The amount of time that we spend in doctor's appointments and therapies is taxing on the kids. They just want to be little kids and be able to play with their friends. I think the most important treatment for them right now is improving the ataxia and myoclonus and preventing the seizures from starting. Preserving their independence is essential. I know there is no cure, but any treatment that could help improve or restore some of the neural connections, or at the very least halt the decline, would be beneficial. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Hannah. I live in California with my husband and my son. He is about eight years old. Um, in about 2012, when I was 36, I gave birth to my son. My friend, who had not seen me for a long time, pointed out my balance problem. At that time, my balance problem was not very noticeable, and he suggested I should get it checked. After a few medical exams, I was diagnosed with SCE1, which I inherited it from my father. I was worried about my son as well as I learned he had a, a 50% chance of inheriting the bad gene. We could not do anything except pray. 
shortly after my diagnosis, my doctor also sent me to a physical therapy. The physical therapist was nice, but it was frustrating that he did not know much about my disease, because ataxia degeneration happens so slowly. I was not showing enough progress for insurance to justify that I continue physical therapy. This year, I decided to represent California and participate the Joint Mission Bintan, a twenty-six point two mile walk. Planning to participate in this walk meant I was followed an exercise training program. While training. I was able to build up my exercise tolerance to walk for one to two hours every day. More exercise means I was more fatigued day to day, but I also noticed my balance was better when going up and down hills. For one year, I participated in a clinical trial. I found the clinical trial procedure was easy to navigate, but I did have to find the time to travel one hour each way every month to get to the clinical trial site. My serum score was the same before and after the trial, which means that my Symptom had now improved according to the doctor's clinical scores. To me, it seems the drug may have helped with slowing down the progression. I did notice a significant decrease of my pain in my leg when I was participating in the trial. My doctor also saw the lack of change in my serum score could be because of my active lifestyle. I'm definitely not as strong as a, an athlete, but I try to keep up with thirty to sixty minutes of exercise every day. I truly believe in the positive effect. Exercise can have, but it feels like exercise is the only treatment I hear about over and over for ataxia. As I think about mine and my family future, I wish there was a treatment that helped to slow the progression of ataxia. Especially, a wish a treatment could address the inevitable deterioration of my balance. I know that many drugs have side effects, like nausea, weight loss, and a decreased appetite. However, if there is a hope for a treatment. I'm willing to put up with the side effects if it makes my ataxia symptom better and allow me to run with my son. My name is Jessica Oberlin. I live in Columbus, Ohio, with my husband Matt and our three daughters. Though I appear healthy, I carry the genetic mutation for a relentlessly progressive neurodegenerative disease. Called spinocerebellar ataxia type three, or SCA three. I am 33 years old, and without the advent of new treatments, I will inevitably begin to have ataxia symptoms in my 40s, lose my ability to walk at an early age, and in all likelihood die from complications related to this disease. I know this because I've seen this disease course through multiple family members. My grandmother and several of her siblings died from SCA three. And four of her eight children have inherited the disease. 
My wonderful dad, Bill, was always very adventurous and athletic prior to his onset of ataxia. Now, at the age of 63, he relies on a walker and has been on long-term disability for about 10 years. He has had three corrective eye surgeries that grant short-term relief from severe double vision. His nights are a constant struggle due to agonizing leg cramps, REM sleep dysfunction, and restless legs, which he currently takes clonazepam and magnesium for. He is never quite sure if the medications actually help since none of them have led to sustained improvements. They often have worsened other symptoms, such as incontinence. He has slurred speech and difficulty swallowing food and liquids without coughing or choking. He suffers from loss of fine motor control and has been experiencing an increased number of falls and injuries. It is heartbreaking to watch him struggle. My dad takes several off-label prescriptions that have demonstrated promise in slowing the disease in animal models of ataxia, but have not been assessed in clinical trials. These include the combination of the muscle relaxants baclofen and chlorzoxazone that were shown to improve Purkinje cell firing, as well as the antidepressant citalopram, which lowered levels of the SCA3 disease protein in mouse models, but again, this has not been studied in humans. Overall, my dad feels that while some of the medications may slightly lessen the discomfort in his symptoms, none eliminate them or delay progression. My dad has also tried experimental treatments like CBD for his restless legs, but found them to be ineffective. His only other treatment is moderate exercise, using his recumbent tricycle and swimming. This must be regulated, though, as excessive exercise has a negative effect on his sleep while not enough, causes increased ataxia symptoms, such as spasticity, cramping, and balance. I tested positive for the SCA3 genetic mutation in 2012. As newlyweds ready to start our family, my husband and I felt that there was only one treatment option that guaranteed a way to stop ataxia from affecting the next generation. We went through in vitro fertilization using a process called pre-implantation genetic diagnosis which enabled us to have our fertilized eggs tested for the disease prior to implanting them to confirm they did not carry the genetic mutation. It was a long, expensive, emotionally and physically challenging process that resulted in one failed round of IVF, then two successful rounds, which resulted in our three greatest blessings, our twins, Avery and Lydia, and our little May. I know many young families affected by ataxia do not have this option and are forced to make very difficult other family planning decisions. Just looking at my own family lineage, you can see the desperation for real treatments. My grandmother chose to donate her brain to ataxia research following her death. My husband and I donated our affected embryonic stem cells that carry the genetic mutation to a lab researching ataxia. Multiple family members have participated in clinical and natural history studies. I'm currently in the Ready Scott Clinical Research Study that requires two spinal taps, annual trips to Minnesota for MRIs, and frequent appointments in Michigan. This is just for a study, not even a trial for treatment. We will do anything. I've witnessed generations in our family hearing that a treatment is around the corner. Aside from prevention and cure of the disease altogether, I am hopeful that we will at least soon see a treatment to delay the age of onset, especially when it comes to my dad's two biggest complaints, balance and his agonizing nights, including cramping, dystonia, and restless legs. After that, I hope for treatments that reduce and eliminate symptoms, such as double vision, speech and swallowing difficulties, fine motor control, general pain, spasticity, and neuropathy. My father is eager and willing to participate in early trials with uncertain outcomes. And despite my being pre-symptomatic, I would willingly take a drug for the rest of my life. We are just one family in this battle, and like countless others, we are committed to partnering with the research community to be instruments in the process for a prevention and a cure. Thank you. I'm Eric Bogles, and I have SCA2. I'm 46 years old and live in Minneapolis. This is my sister, Michelle, who will tell you some of my history since my speech can be hard to understand. 
SEHU has followed our family for generations. Eric is the fourth that we know. He inherited from our mom who died at age 64. Eric was 24 years old and in the army when he first noticed, it, noticed symptoms. He noticed the loss of coordination, especially when he was stressed or tired. He could still do his job and no one else had noticed the symptoms. However, when his unit received orders to go to Iraq, he knew he'd be a liability to himself and others. He had watched our mom progress, so he figured he knew what was wrong. He was tested and as he figured, he was diagnosed with SCA2. He was immediately retired from the army many years before he planned. Five years ago, he could walk across the lawn unaided, but now he can't walk a few feet without holding on to something. He is currently living in an apartment by himself, but it can be dangerous. He has had some dangerous falls, including one where he fell into a hot burner on his stove. He has been considering moving to an assisted living at age 46. He has tried to slow the progression or manage some of the symptoms using medical and non-medical therapies and aids. Eric uses a walker and an electric wheelchair. He didn't want to be relying on them, so he held off as long as he could, but now they're a necessity. He has tried Chantex in an attempt to help with his balance. His doctor said it had helped some patients with epilepsy with their muscle movements. He didn't see quick results and the fear of the side effects caused him to quit after a few weeks. He has also tried medical marijuana. His neurologist suggested trying it to see if it would help with any symptoms. It did help him sleep better, which helped with the fatigue. It also helped his lack of appetite, so he was able to eat more. However, the yearly certifications was expensive in addition to the prescriptions so he made the decision not to continue. For fatigue, he has used modafinil. This works and he'll use it if he has an especially busy day. This allows him to plan for events such as volunteering for the ataxia events. The downside is that the effects last too long and he can't sleep at night, and it also eliminates his appetite. Instead, he chooses to use energy drinks, which help with the fatigue and the effects don't last as long. To help with many of his symptoms, such as stability, speech, and coordination, he tried a weighted vest, which he had seen demonstrated with others with ataxia. This did improve his balance and speech. It gave him more confidence to be more social. However, the effects didn't last long, and it was hot and uncomfortable. To improve his body movements, Eric went to a doctor who was a movement specialist. He studied Eric's walk and suggested changes to improve his gait. This therapy helped him feel like he was fighting his ataxia and gave him something to look forward to. It seemed to help for a while, but the effects faded. To keep his overall strength, Eric has tried to stay active. He works out in a gym. He also rode multiple different tricycles since he couldn't balance on a bicycle. This was great until it became too difficult to use. I keep hearing about breakthroughs that are on the horizon. For years, I've been waiting for something to help with my symptoms or bring out the disease. I am frustrated at what feels like slow progress. I would be willing to try almost anything to slow or stop my progression. The side effects and costs could be deterrent. Cost is an important factor since most patients with the tax sale are on a fixed income. I'm just really waiting for some therapies or cures since I see my body deteriorating. My name is Brett. I'm 34 years old and I live in Utica, Michigan. I was diagnosed with SCA1 at 29 years of age. We have a dense family history of SCA1. My grandmother had SCA and all four of her children developed it. My dad, Brent Masserons, her son, 
was inducted in the Monroe Catholic Central Sports Hall of Fame 2011 and was one of the only people to finish the CPA licensing exam in the 80s, all four parts without a retake. He was very smart and very athletic and I watched the taxi upbreak him. I am pretty smart. I have a Juris Doctorate and pretty athletic. I've broke some Guinness World Records and I'm watching the Odyssey break me. Um, Odyssey has spasms in muscles. The spasms are spastic movement, which is either a lack of control or cramping muscles that I'm not even using. Ataxia for me has definitely been a downward progression. Every day since I was 15, I work out, but since 29, I keep losing strength. We need something other than my working out to stop the progression. One form of exercise specific for ataxia I do every day is balance exercise. They sort of help me, but it seems like they are delaying the inevitable. I don't really get better. I don't know if I would get worse if I did not do them. I've been on several different prescription medications for Zexiel and, and an Ataxia trial drug for the last four years. It has not been very effective. The first two non-trial medicines I tried for about five months ago. I take baclofen, eight pills a day, and chlorazoxazone, four pills a day. They create nausea and dizziness, but it is not as bad as ataxia, so I'm okay with the side effects. They help with my muscle tightness and spasticity, and seem to be relieving the symptoms by about 30%. I use several things that are not prescription. I take green tea powder for energy to combat ataxia, taking your energy away. I also take Arginine, 10 pills a day for repairing cerebellar receptors. I read about that in a study from Japan. I'm not sure if either of them are doing anything, but I keep taking them because I'm scared not to. I am 34 and I take over 20 pills a day just to be Third, the effectiveness of a regular person. I have taken CBD pills to help with cramping and sleep, but they were not very effective. Sometimes I feel more anxious. I worry about the possibility of losing the ability to walk, speak, eat, and eventually dying. My mood is often very changeable. It is easier to get down with a taxi off. It is easier to feel worse. I've never seen a therapist, but I'm considering one. If there was a new treatment, the most important symptom I would like to treat is balance. I know if my balance was better, I could walk and lift things more stably, and I would feel more confident. I would definitely like to see a new treatment cell, the progression. Thank you.
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Brett, and all of our panelists who really clearly dug uh, deep and, and shared so much of their journey and, and their treatment journey. Um, clearly, we uh, heard a lot about a lot of different approaches to treatments, and we want to keep hearing about those in this session. If we can show our discussion questions here, um, again, we really want to understand the full range, not just medicines, but the, whatever it might, you might use in daily life to make life a little bit easier, or things that you might uh, you know, use, and as many of our panelists said, even whether or not uh, you know that they're effective for you. Um, but we're going to start off by getting a sense of some of those things and understanding how effective um, they've been for you with a series of polling questions. Um, so if, if you've just joined us, you weren't uh, able to tune into some of the earlier sessions. If you are an individual living with ataxia or a caregiver of a person with ataxia, we would like for you to pull out your phone, open up, or you can open up a tab uh, in a browser on your computer. Go to pollev.com forward slash ataxia, and please join us as we uh, will be going to these throughout this session on approaches to treatment. So here we want to understand from you, are you using any of the following um, medicines to manage your SCA or DRPLA symptoms and check all that apply. So here, you know, if you're uh, any and all of these that you're using, please uh, select those uh, from this list. Um, the options are A, prescription medications for muscular issues, some examples provided there, B, anti-seizure medicines, C, psychotropic medications, D, acetyl DL leucine, E, CoQ10, F, over-the-counter medications, again, some uh, examples provided. G, medical or recreational marijuana or cannabis oil or CBD. H, dietary and herbal supplements. I, other medications not named above. Or J, if you are not currently using any medications or supplements. And I should note that we will be asking about other types of treatment modalities in future questions where we're focused really here on uh, medicines, both uh, prescription over the counter, as well as dietary and herbal supplements. So um, please select all that you are using or your loved one is using. Uh, select that all that apply, um, like before, because uh, this is a question where uh, we can see, or your, uh, our respondents can select more than one option. We're seeing a percentage of responses. So this does not represent a percentage of individuals that have selected the option on the screen. Um, so you can think of it as a ranking kind of exercise with the bars. And as it's looking right now, we're seeing some of our top experience with different medications and supplements um, being with uh, the range of different prescription uh, medications for, the, for muscular issues, followed behind uh, dietary and herbal supplements. Um, we heard about some of those from our panelists. Um, after that, it looks like we've got some, a lot of experience with other over-the-counter medications as well as CoQ10. Um, as well as a, a number of people who are using other things that are not named above. And so we definitely want to hear about that. Um, we do have experience with, with all of the different treatments that are listed. Um, as, and I, I should note that we have a fair amount of experience of people who are not currently using any medications or supplements. And we really want to hear from you as well during this session. This is, you know, uh, your considerations for why you're not using any of these things. Whether, you know, is it, you know, just the stage of where you're at in your condition? Uh, is it concerns about potential side effects of these? You know, whatever it might be that's informing your decision to not use any of these, please let us know. So with that, we're gonna go to our second polling question. Uh, so as promised, beyond medications and supplements, we wanna know about what other of the following things you are using to manage your SCA and DRPLA symptoms. Again, please select all that apply. The options are A, exercise, B, physical therapy, C, occupational therapy, D, speech therapy, E, aqua therapy, F, mobility aids, such as walkers, scooters, or wheelchairs, uh, G, modified home environment, H, diet modifications, I, complementary or alternative therapies, J, special education programs, K, counseling or other therapy, for example, talk therapy, L, other things beyond what we've listed uh, on this slide, other approaches or, or ways to try to manage your condition and its symptoms. And then M, if you are not currently using any of these, uh, any uh, approaches to managing your symptoms, uh, you can select M. So again, please select all that apply.
We'll give you a few more moments to get your responses in here. Um, as it stands, it looks like the top treatment or, or management approach is through exercise, uh, followed by use of mobility aids and physical therapy, perhaps number four being a modified home environment. I would really love for, uh, you know, uh, for those of you that have selected these to let us know, um, you know, why you chose to uh, uh, approach and try these different management techniques, how well it's working, if at all, why you choose to, to, to continue using these things. Um, and it's great to see that we do have experience across all other management approaches listed on this slide. Um, and much, many fewer uh, that are not using any of these additional types of management approaches, um, uh, at least relative to uh, the previous question where we were talking about medications and supplements. There was a larger proportion of our, our uh, audience today that's not using any medications or supplements, but it appears that they are using some of these management techniques. Um, one more polling question for now. If we go to our third polling question. So thinking about all of those things, all of those medicines, all of those supplements, all of those other techniques and approaches for treatment, how well does that current regimen control your symptoms overall? And your options are here, A, not at all, B, very little, C, somewhat, D, to a great extent, or E, if uh, it isn't, it, this is not applicable because you are not using any of those approaches treatments or approaches. Mm -hmm. So again, please select the category that best represents your experience or your loved one's experience with their current treatment regimen. And as you're uh, thinking about this and putting in your response, uh, you know, be thinking about what you might be able to share about why you chose which of these categories uh, you know, while uh, these polling questions are great for kind of getting a sense of what the audience's experience is, um, you know, the, the, really the devil's in, in the details of it. And we want to know, you know, why, you know, here is uh, if you were in the just over 50 percent that's saying you're getting s somewhat, is this helping your uh, sy symptoms overall? What does that actually mean? What symptoms is it helping? How much? Um, we're seeing about just under 30 per, thir, uh, a third of people saying that it's helped very little. Again, um, you know, want to get your assessment. Uh, we're seeing a, a small uh, proportion of people under 5% saying that it's not, not, these things have not helped at all. Um, you know, so want to know what it is you've tried that's not helped at all. Mm -hmm. And then uh, for those of you that have had uh, help to a great extent in controlling your symptoms, you know, again, what are you using? How did you know, uh, how have you noticed uh, the, these symptom improvements? What does that before and after look like? And then again, uh, consistent with our other answers, some individuals uh, have not used any treatments. And again, wanna understand uh, where you're at in your journey and why, why that is. So let's broaden this now to the discussion. I wanna invite you, uh, our audience live today, to uh, call in, write in with your comments. You can call in, get in the queue for us to uh, be able to have a little bit of a conversation together, um, hear about your treatment experiences. That number is 1-703-844-3231. Again, that's 1-703-844-3231. That number is on the webpage uh, that you're on with the live stream. You can call in at any time. Um, also, you can write in it at any time. Under that live stream, you'll see that comment box, that written comment box. Please submit your comments. We'll be reading those throughout. Um, even if we don't get to reading your comment today, it will be included in the voice of the patient report, that summary report that we'll be putting together. Um, but to get us started here, uh, I want to come and welcome our Zoom panel, another great uh, uh, selection of some members of your own community that are going to be participating in this conversation. Uh, maybe we'll start with you, Greg, um, you know, thinking through all of those different treatment experiences. Um, maybe let's start with what has worked well. You know, what would you call maybe a treatment success? And, um, you know, I, I know uh, that, Greg, uh, you might, I know a little bit about your experience that um, you've, you are not on any medications, but I'm curious if in that second category, there's anything that you've used that's worked for you. So, Greg, why don't you start us off? Um, Basically, all I do is try to stay healthy and exercise and go on daily walks. Uh, that's what I currently use. 
I see, uh, we heard from Dr. Wilmot, and he's my neurologist this okay. morning, and I see him a couple of times a year, and he'll discuss, we'll talk about symptoms, and he'll talk about treatments, but my ataxia has not progressed to the point of um, taking medications or speech therapy. Mm -hmm. I did, early on in diagnosis, he sent me to a physical therapist. Mm -hmm that specializes in, uh, in balance. How did so, that, uh, that, how did that physical therapist, um, you know, kind of regimen, physical therapy regimen work for you? Did you notice any, uh, improvement? Did you notice you, f did you feel any more stable? Um, you know, any feedback that you have on that? I, I didn't notice anything from the physical therapy. I'm sure maybe long term there is some effect, but Short term, it was hard to notice any effect at all on a short term sure, sure. basis. So, like, um, she sent me home to do daily exercises to keep up. And over time, I, I continued those exercises for, for a while, and then I quit because I didn't notice, like, any improvement. And, okay. and the time that it took each day to do the exercises didn't seem like there was enough improvement to okay. continue. No, that's very important to hear and understand. So thank you, Greg, for sharing that. Maybe we'll go to uh, Brian. Again, as you're thinking through all of those, uh, that whole you know large menu of, of uh, possible treatments, um, although as reported in the polling, you know, not necessarily providing everyone with, uh, you know, the symptom relief that we would really hope for. But, you know, where have you seen some, you know, benefits or, or treatment successes in, in your experience? Uh, well, I think it's, uh, I think it's really difficult to uh, determine uh, improvement because even if something, you um, slows the progression that's really difficult to measure um you know you you don't know how you're slowing the progression and so i mean i i work out about three uh three times a week um like i i lift weights um i i take uh, uh um uh, muscle relaxant um to help with some muscle cramping that I mm. have experienced. Um, and then I, I do get an occasional massage. Um, and I think that can also help. Um, I mean, I think before I was diagnosed with SCA seven, I, I, um, I had, my muscles were tight to begin with. And so I think, um, massaging and, um, muscle relaxants I think do help but I mean it's really I mean as I mentioned it's it's really <laughs> difficult to know yeah so so I think what you, you've said something really important um, you said that you know you don't think it's really helping the uh, progression but that some of these things have helped you some um, and so I'm I'm just wondering when you say something like even massage um, you know, help some, what, what does it help? Is it certain symptoms it relieves? What does that provide you? Um, you know, I think it's just an overall, um, better feeling like, you know, you, it's just a better feeling overall. I mean, okay. I, I mean, uh, I know some people don't enjoy, um, massage, Mm -hmm. I do. I think it's, I think it feels good. And so I think it's just kind of that overall, uh, feeling that you feel a little bit better. I mean, even I would say, um, early on in my disease, um, like when I worked out, I felt better afterwards. And I think, but as my disease progressed, um, I just, I don't feel the same after I work out, but I, I feel like it's got to be helping. Sure, sure. So th uh, I, I kind of that general feeling of, of benefit is, I mean, it's 
uh, very good to know, even if it's not something specific. So I want to remind our, our audience um, that you can call in if we can uh, pull up that phone number uh, one, one more time here, just to remind you that if you have a, a treatment success or something that you think has helped in some way, even uh, with just one specific um, uh, a symptom, you can dial in now. It's 1-703-844-3231. That's 1-703-844-3231. Um, so uh, just while we're, we're doing that, I uh, want to go one more time to our, our Zoom panel and kind of keep rounding out this discussion, seeing what else maybe has been uh, working for you. And uh, you know, let's let's get a, a caregiver perspective here and, and go to Maya. Um, you know, where have you seen any um, you know benefits from from what is available? Um, well, the progression of the illness of my son, who had a juvenile DRPLA, and my husband, who has the midlife um, um, DRPLA, it's very different. Um, Ryan's is, um, our son's is a lot more aggressive. So we had to go through all the aids and all the walking aids and all the different things a lot faster. But I think it's really, really important what uh, Brian said is you don't actually know whether you are slowing it down or not. So right. stick with it. Try to do your best because that's all you can do is, um, and I do believe that exercise will help you feel better. Um, it, it gives you some control over your body and it will make you feel better. And I would urge you to look on the National Ataxia website. Do they have exercise lists there that you can follow um, at so, home, so even Maya. if you're in a wheelchair? Um, and that's really useful. That's been very useful for us. Yeah, can you give maybe, you know, you're saying that it can be really helpful. Can you give an example of how it's been helpful, um, you know, in, in your family's life? The ex, you know, that exercise. For program. instance, um, yes, for instance, absolutely. Um, our son goes to hydrotherapy. We take him swimming regularly, virtually every afternoon after school. And um, we definitely see when he wasn't able to do this due to the lockdown of COVID. His core strength has really changed. He was slumping forwards in his walker. He wasn't able to lift his head up as much. We have started this again for the past two months. Okay. And again, he's sitting up much more, uh, much better, and he's moving forwards in his walker much better. So it definitely does help, and it can improve your symptoms as well. I don't think it's just about keeping the progression slower i think it actually does give the body um you know if you don't use it you lose it but you can regain it mm. so so i would really encourage people to try any form of exercise that they can do if you can't cycle anymore do a spinning class it's stable i've, I've talked to my husband into this so um you 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 should try to work with your illness and yeah. find a solution that if you can't do something, that doesn't mean you can't do anything. Mm -hmm. just, yeah. just find a different way of doing things. Thank you, Maya. Uh, really appreciate that. And good to know that, um, you know, in your experience, that exercise actually could uh, help with gaining some uh, kind of ability mm -hmm. back. I um, want to check in. Uh, yeah. I, I, know, I think we've been getting some written comments. Uh, any any success stories? Yeah, I mean, I, I think exercise obviously is a theme here. Um, David from Arizona living with SCA8 says, I deal with the physical aspects of ataxia through exercise. It has been very effective. I ride bicycles between 100 and 250 miles per week. This guy is a cyclist. <laughs> uh, the right amount of exercise is different every day. Too much seems to bring symptoms on just as much as not enough. Um, and then one other comment that, that uh, expands on that a little bit. Um, this is Doug living with SCA6. He says, in late 2017, I was diagnosed with SCA6 and still continue to work until October 2019. I retired being a danger more to myself. Mm. In February 2019, I began physical therapy through March of 2020. Since March, I've been exercising on YouTube, and now I'm also back to in-person uh, PT. I just recently acquired a balance vest uh, still trying to adapt to it. It seems to be helping and hope for improvements going forward. 
Uh, I've tried to enroll in some clinical trials at USF, but was not qualified for whatever reason. I'll keep trying. Um, I'm going to continue what I'm doing and hope for the best. So, um, and then one last, one last uh, one that we really haven't heard much about. This is Karen living with SCA3 says, I have acupuncture on average three mm -hmm. times per month. I take daily Chinese herbs for inflammation, neuropathy, pain, and balance. I recently added a Tao patch, which helps a lot with balance. <laughs> I also exercise a lot and will try anything. Wow. Great. Thank you so much. And just a reminder, please keep sending in those comments. That's great. Um, we want to hear from as many voices as possible today. Um, we know every, uh, every uh, treatment is going to be different for every person. And uh, so to hear you know, those differences uh, is, is really valuable. Um, so I see we have a, a caller, Mary Beth, from Sioux Falls, South Dakota, representing SCA 15 uh, with, with a, um, a treatment therapy we haven't heard much about yet, uh, uh, hydroaquatic therapy. Mary Beth would love to hear your experience with that. Uh, Mary Beth, are you with us? Hi, yes I am. Welcome. Uh, okay, I just want to let you guys know that my swimming, I call it swimming, but it's really not much swimming. I'm just doing a lot of exercise in the water is, is great for me. Um, like every, almost everybody else, I have a lot of mobility problems and balance issues and mm -hmm. I just want to say I've noticed that water is like the great equalizer, you know, I just feel so much more, quote, normal. I can walk, act, water jog, you know, I put that little, um, that blue belt around me, most people can identify with that, and yeah. water jog, and I, I do walk, but it, uh, it's, a, it's a physical therapy pool, and so it has... Um, grab bars in the water and so I or whatever parallel bars you know and so those I walk there and that's it just feels really good I can stretch out and oh, I was doing some land therapy and with a physical therapist and mm -hmm. I said can I do the stuff in the water and he said sure so you know like someone will throw a ball to me and that really helps with um, oh, where something is in space because I, I have a difficulty with that and my gait and mm. it always challenges me to put my feet closer together. <laughs> I'm like, oh, and then I'm going to fall over. But so what if you fall over in the water? So so this is actually this, um, you know, kind of hydroaquatic therapy that you just described to us, your your take on that. That's actually helped with your coordination and your, your gait a bit? Oh, yeah, I think it does. I go once a week, and I probably could go more often because it challenges it, and just is a good pra is a good you know for me to practice it. Yeah, it does help. I mean, I I feel like it does. You know, just like what I said, every little bit. I'm 48. I was diagnosed when I was 40, so I don't want to go down any sooner than I sooner than I will. So I sure. just keep sure. this going. Absolutely. No, thank you so much, Mary Beth. That's uh, so helpful to hear that treatment experience. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, Good. yeah, thank you very much. So uh, now what I want to do is um, kind of keep broadening this. Of course, if you want to share uh, things that have worked well for you, we want to keep hearing those. But um, we're going to now kind of broaden the discussion to maybe share things that have not worked as well. Um, or uh, other downsides of treatment. So maybe you, you've tried a therapy and it is giving you some benefit or, uh, or as some described, um, it, you're unsure if it's giving you a benefit, but you continue to do it. Um, but it comes with some downside. Um, and so to get us thinking about this kind of uh, range of topics, we have another polling question for you. Um, so if we can go to our fourth polling question uh, for this topic. Um, so here we want to know about those challenges. What are the major challenges with your current treatment approaches? Again, thinking back to all of those different options that we, we started this discussion with. And here, uh, select up to three. So pick the top three uh, most challenging aspects of your current treatment approaches. A, they're not very effective. B, they have a high cost or copay or not covered by insurance. C, they're of limited availability. D, you're unable to access the services because of transportation issues. E, the number of pills or medications needed per day. F, negative side effects of those therapies. G, they require too much effort. H, it requires too much of a time commitment. I, some other major challenge that we haven't had listed. Or J, not applicable because you're not using any treatment approaches. So please select up to the uh, up to three here. So what are the, the uh, top three major challenges with your current treatment approaches?
give you a few more moments here to think about this. Uh, as it stands, and again, this is uh, these are percentages of responses. So this is kind of a ranking. We're seeing the top um, choice, uh, you know, top top three choice as uh, being a those. Uh, therapies are not very effective, being the major challenge. After that, we're seeing uh, the high cost and copay or and lack of insurance coverage, followed very closely by limited availability or negative side effects. So we want to hear about these things. You know, when when you say something's not very effective, you know, how did you know that, or or what makes you believe that? Um, did that make you you know stop taking a therapy, or do you still continue taking it? Very uh, valuable to understand those treatment decisions that you make. Um, we do see here every one of these being picked as top three uh, challenges amongst our audience, including others, others that are not listed here. So we definitely want to hear about those. And uh, again, consistent with our other questions, we do have um, a, a part of our population that's participating today that are not currently taking any treatments. Um, so uh, on this uh, topic of, of uh, challenges with treatment approaches, I'd like to go back to our Zoom panel and kind of start the discussion there. And perhaps, Doug, um, could you share with us um, any, any treatment challenges or, or downsides that you've experienced? Well, actually, um, I think there have been many disappointments, but I, I echo what Brian and Maya said. I think that exercise is important. But as with, well, with a, a disease like this, you are bound to have some, some things that really don't work out. So... Yeah, so are there any examples of those for, that, that you've had, things you've tried and, and, and stopped using? Oh, sure. Uh, oh, well, uh, hey, I, I think the doctors are somewhat limited as far as what they can prescribe. So I have tried you know, different forms of medication that really has not worked, but it's kind of a trial and error thing. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Doug. Why don't we also go to Jessica on this topic of, of treatment challenges, Any anything, uh, treatment that maybe wasn't effective or, or maybe some of these uh, different downsides of therapies that really stood out to you in that list, of the, in that polling question? Yeah. So, um, my perspective is a little bit different where I'm currently mostly pre-symptomatic. Um, I've watched this disease progress through my dad. Um, but for me, they're really, the problem is the lack of treatment. Um, I exercise as often as I can. Um, I'm in my thirties now. I will probably start seeing symptoms in my forties and the only treatment I have is to exercise. Um, I would love it if there were a treatment that I could start taking now um, that might even push out, give me some time, um, the age of onset, um, delay progression. Um, but for me, it's just, I have to sit and wait. Um, and I know it's coming. I've watched it, um, not just for my dad, but through other family members. Um, so it's really the lack of treatment um, that I'm really struggling with. Sure, no, and that makes a lot of sense. Um, but knowing your family experience, you know, with the, the treatments that are out there, are there any of the, you know, side effects or downsides that concern you? You know, maybe in the future, if if you're presented with what is currently available now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, even just looking at, at my current situation, um, I just started having really bad restlessness at night in my arms and my legs. Mm -hmm. um, I've tried CBD. I don't know if I'm not doing it right, but it hasn't been working. Um, I did just the prescription that my doctor or my neurologist wanted to give me. Um, I'm already struggling with insurance, trying to get it approved. So he said he, he really doesn't want to, but we're going to have to start with this. Um, and that right there just kind of turned me off. So I'm, I'm trying to, um, figure out just my very first symptom. I'm going to try to naturally figure it out 
do a better sleep pattern, um, and things like that. But it's very discouraging when that happens. Um, the very first symptom I have, I'm struggling to get the medication that I need. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you, Jessica. Yeah. I see we have a, a couple of uh, callers um, that have uh, some experiences they want to share. Why don't we start with uh, Jackie? Jackie's from uh, Minnesota and the parent of a 28-year-old -year daughter with SCA17. Um, so would love to hear about uh, your daughter's treatment experiences. Jackie, are you with us? Yeah. Yes. Welcome. Um, so... My daughter, Angela, was diagnosed when she was 15. She's 28 now. And um, she was on one medication to try um, d just to maybe give her a longer uh, time frame where she could use a computer and things like that. Mm -hmm. It was carvedopa, levodopa. And she was so, so sick from it, um, vomiting and she went down to about 70 pounds. Mm -hmm. um, so we got her off of that, um, in which she had to be weaned off of it because she was on like 12 pills a day. Wow. So that took months to get her off. And so now our daughter, um, she cannot walk. She cannot speak. Um, she cannot move her arms or move her eyes on mm. command. Um, she cannot feed herself. She cannot sit up. Um, when we have her in a wheelchair, she is strapped in. And so um, I would never, we could not put her on any medications because she could not communicate to us if she is now in pain or if she's hurting. Sure. And because of what she went through before, we just couldn't do that to her. But we have been trying for years and years now to um, keep her strong, um, giving her good food, high calorie, trying to keep her weight up, good rest, um, massaging, um, to keep her muscles relaxed, and um, and we, Angela's at home with us, and we've just been trying so hard to keep her strong um, mm -hmm. because our plea to you is for um, a treatment for a cure. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, thank you so much for both sharing the, you know, your your daughter's experience with treatment um, and that, that yeah. really bad downside that came with it, but also that just that consideration of, of kind of the expectation of, of kind of the benefit that you would need um, in order to justify giving her a medication given that she can't communicate about potential side effects of it. So I really, really appreciate that, Jackie. Yeah, okay. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to also uh, go on the phones to uh, Patrick, who's calling in from Michigan and representing uh, SCA3, uh, wants to share some of his treatment experiences. Uh, Patrick, are you with us? Yes. Welcome. I'd love to, to hear about um, uh, your, your treatment experiences, whether that's uh, successes or, or, or maybe some downsides, but uh, whatever is you wanted to share, uh, please go ahead. Well, Okay, I've had this for about 20 years, and I guess I'm doing pretty well. But um, one thing that helped me, last year I worked, I had a hard project, and I um, took Rylusol mm -hmm. and had balanced physical therapy, and that seemed to work and get me through that year. And then I retired the next year, and I've been retired, and um, a couple things have helped me. I still take the Rylusol, and I um, also recently bought a little scooter, and I can walk the dog and everything. It really makes a quality of life difference. If we, unfortunately, maybe some people can't afford it, but um, a scooter really helps to get around the yard and to get around um, the sure. area and everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the. the and, the Raleigh, you mentioned that you started taking it and you're kind of uh, while you're still working and 
now that you've retired, you're, you're still taking that. How has, what kind of, what specific symptoms has that helped with? Um, it seems to help in general. Just in Balance general. and everything. But I don't have much balance left. Mm-hmm. I can't really walk more than 20 feet or 30 feet or something without grabbing something. Sure. But um, I think it's helped. It, 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 but it's hard with this disease. You know, if something's helping, because you're always regressing. So it's just slowing right. that down or not, you don't know. Right. Sure. Another thing I've had um, great success with okay. is um, marijuana, but you have to smoke it right before bed mm-hmm. because you lose your balance completely, mm. but it makes you sleep really well, mm. which is very, very important. But yeah, if you get if you don't get a good night's sleep, you're a mess the next day. Yeah. Yeah. Can you tell but, me a little um, bit about really that, sleep. Patrick? When you, when you get a good night's Perfect. sleep. When you get a good night's sleep because of, uh, you know, uh, the medical marijuana, uh, what is that, like, how does that affect your quality of life the next day? Can you maybe give me an example? Oh, it completely wears off the next day. So you don't feel the marijuana. Yeah, the, but, um, the sleep. When you get a good night's happened, sleep, how does that help? Yeah. Uh, what happened? Oh, that helps tremendously. Like, sometimes you have to get up and go to the bathroom maybe 10 times in the night. Mm-hmm. And then you're not getting any sleep, and you feel real suicidal the next day. Mm-hmm. You really feel suicidal. But the marijuana just helps tremendously. But you lose your balance. You don't have any coordination. So you've right. got to be pretty much sitting down and laying down when you smoke it. Mm-hmm. Sitting down, probably. Mm-hmm. And then you're not, not anticipating much movement except this is the bedroom. Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, thank you're you so much, Patrick. You're not going to try anything in it. Oh, sure, sure. Thank you so much, Patrick. This has been very uh, helpful. Um, I know that we've been getting some written comments as well, so I want to check in with Andrew here. Yeah, so I I see a couple themes here in the comments that are coming in, James. One is obviously finding clinicians who know enough about ataxia to help. Um, Mary, living with SCA6, says, sorry, I just lost my... Spot here um, says I have not found a doctor that can recommend anything beyond a try this. Uh, I didn't experience any improvement, but the side effects made me tired, foggy, and dizzy. So I'm hesitant to try anything else until I find a doctor with expertise that I can trust. Mm-hmm. And again, this I think gets to the overall issue of awareness of ataxia, even within the medical community, finding more people that understand and can and can recommend things that will be helpful. Um, I also thought I was moved by a comment from Andrea, a caregiver of a DRPLA patient. Exercise is wonderful, but when your child has an IQ of 57 and walking is hard, it is very difficult to get him to exercise. Mm. So I think the, you know, again, just sort of a powerful statement. Um, So those were uh, a couple of the sort of the themes I'm seeing in some of the comments. Sure, sure. Keep those comments coming in. Uh, We want to keep hearing from you, uh, your treatment experiences. Uh, and again, if you want to uh, call in as well, you can dial in at 1-703-844-3231. If you want to write in with some comments, you can put them into that little comment box that's right on the, uh, the screen with the live stream. Um, so we have a familiar voice uh, that is uh, a caller right now. We have Tom, uh, who has actually one of our earlier panelists, you may remember, from Minnesota uh, with uh, SCA1. Um, who's dialed in by phone to talk about some uh, downsides of treatments um, he's tried. So, Tom, are you with us? Yes, I am. Welcome. Um, I wanted to, to say I have a hard time getting to be physical therapy and I pay physical therapy mm-hmm. because I can't drive. Mm-hmm. I do depend on members of my family, but it's pretty erratic in far as getting two things. We do have a physical occupational therapy place here that is great, but it's very hard to get there. Sure, sure. So um, if I'm hearing you, you know, you've um, you found that there's benefit in participating in physical and occupational therapy, but Given that you, it's hard for you and your with your disability to drive, um, that it's hard to get there, get to actually get to those appointments. 
um, probably something that's pretty broadly applicable to you know, across different types of appointments. Um, so thank you so much, Tom, for mentioning that. Wondering if um, any of our Zoom panelists uh, might have any uh, comments uh, related to you know those burdens of actually receiving care, whether that's travel or the amount of time and otherwise. If I could see maybe a, a show of hands of anyone that wants to speak to that issue, Doug. Um, Doug, why don't you uh, let us know what, you, what your thoughts are? I think I think that maybe you should approach it from whatever works for you. As far uh, of course, exercise is important, but also you know just having a good frame of mind mm -hmm. and. If you find something that works as far as medication, you might try it for a while. Mm -hmm. For instance, I, our last caller spoke about uh, how he takes marijuana in bed, and I do that as well okay. as the Riliazole, which has some some effects, positive effects, so I think you got to take it wherever it comes. Yeah, can you maybe uh, give us a little bit of a glimpse into the positive effect either the, the marijuana or the Ryuzol has had for you, Doug? Well, the, as far as the Ryuzol is concerned, I'm up here in Boston, Massachusetts, so Dr. Schmaman is my neurologist, and you know it's a little things like shaving. I I was after I started the Riliazole, I could shave without cutting myself, so that was an accomplishment. Wow. That is quite a very important one. So, yeah, thank you. And the same thing with the marijuana, mm -hmm. it helps me to sleep at night. Oh, sure. Um, and, and just, you know, to, to probe on that, you know, what is, you know, after a night where you get a, a good night's sleep, you know, what, what, how does that help with your quality of life the next day? Is there an example you could give? Oh, well, uh, as the caller said, he, when you have a good night's sleep, you feel normal. When you're up all night, then we've all experienced that. That's kind of how it is. So it's not so much that you have a great night's sleep with the marijuana. It's just you have a lousy night's sleep without. Without it. Mm, sure. Yeah. Thank you, Doug. I saw Jessica, do you raised your hand? You want to add something here? Um, no, just um, in regards to traveling, yeah. um, I do have, I have many relatives that also have ataxia and um, one of them does live alone and I could see um, if there was a treatment um, that you had to go somewhere regularly. I mean, just getting groceries and doing regular tasks. I mean, thank goodness we have uh, ride share services, but you know, with the taxi, that's hard. That's, that's very challenging. So I, I can see um, where that would be. Um, very difficult. Um, and with the sleep with my dad, um, when he has a bad night, it's, it's awful. The next day is awful. Yeah. Um, it makes all of his other symptoms much worse. Um, he takes several medications at night, but, um, he still, um, has rough nights, I would say 90% of the time. So, um, it, it just makes everything else with the taxi worse. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, any, any from our, our panel, again, with a show of hands, any unique uh, or maybe newly realized um, uh, burdens, you know, in the era of COVID-19? You know, I think that's in all of our lives, we're, we're learning, you know, certain things are harder, certain things are easier, uh, maybe even um, with all of the, the changes in our, the way that we're living life. But, um, you know, I saw a, a show of a hand from Doug, anyone else t as well that wants to, you know, maybe has thoughts on this? All right, well, we'll start with Doug, um, and then we'll go to Maya. Well, the only thing I can say about the COVID, this is a very slow-moving disease. In my case, you know, 
uh, many of ours, we see over, uh, well, let's say since February or March, mm-hmm. if you don't go out, it's that old thing, use it or lose it. So we're more susceptible to mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Sure. Well, that That's a really good insight, probably when I... I hadn't even th- thought of, but uh, Maya, do you want to add something as well? Um, yes, I do. Um, COVID has really affected people with disabilities. My son, our son counts as a person with disabilities. He's in a wheelchair. He can't speak. He can't, um, you know, look after himself. He can't feed himself. And I think people with limited lifespan, um, because his is a very aggressive form. Doug, I'm really pleased that yours isn't. And there are many forms of ataxia that are very slow progressing. However, the more juvenile you get it, um, the younger you get it, the more aggressive it seems to be. And taking away um, a, a large chunk of somebody's life, not allowing them the social interaction or going to the movies or anything that they would enjoy because their enjoyment is very limited, Mm -hmm. um, I think is very cruel. And I think the governments really need to look at people with disabilities as far as COVID is concerned. And I wanted to also just mention on the um, taking the medication and trying different things. Um, One of the big symptoms of many people with ataxia is dysphagia, so swallowing issues. Yes. Um, And if you are trying to swallow these massive horse-like tablets Mm -hmm. um, of supplements that are meant to be good for you, but, um, for instance, we had, we tried... um, uh, we tried one and it was t- 10 massive tablets per day. And there was absolutely no way our son could physically do that. So I think it's really, really important. Also, CBD oil can be extremely, um, in, in the quali- quantities that he needs to take it, it can be very, very difficult to take. Um, so, um, you know, because of the dysphagia part of it, it can be quite limited in what they can take. Oh, very important. Thank you for for adding that to the conversation, Maya. Um, I, again, I know I see we're getting some more written comments, so I want to check. Yeah, out. yeah. Another theme I think we've seen here is uh, the 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 idea of side effects, and several of you have brought up. It's really difficult to know sometimes whether the treatment you're taking or what someone has suggested is helping, right? And I think this comment captures that perfectly. Sandy, who's living with SCA7, says, the muscle relaxer that my neurologist prescribed makes me sleepy or somewhat weak. Not sure if the side effects outweigh the benefits. Mm. And I think that, again, I think it's really difficult um, as, as another challenge here in understanding is it worth what I'm doing um, if I'm not really seeing something significant? So, yeah. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you to everyone. Um, we're going to use uh, the remaining time we have. We have another very important question to get to um, that I want to spend some time on, and that is related now to uh, future treatment. So, you've told us all a lot about what it is you're currently doing, how well that's working, or in many cases, either not working or unsure of whether it's working. Um, and, and some of those important downsides um, th- that are the trade-offs that come with those. But now we want to look towards the future and really understand, um, you know, short of a cure, I think we, that is definitely the goal for all of us is the cure for your ataxias, but short of that, that next product that might be coming down the pipeline, um, you know, what specifically would you look for, be looking for in that treatment um, that would, would help you in some important way in your life um, and maybe a way to think about this is, you know, what, what minimum amount of, of, of whatever uh, kind of treatment benefit might it be that, that would really mean something for you? Um, and, and if you can really give us maybe examples of those, uh, that would be, I think, helpful for us to kind of really understand what it is. Um, and when we talk about treatment benefits uh, or, or other factors that would be important to you in taking treatments, um, you know, think of that really broadly. It's not just necessarily that it helps with one symptom or another. If that's important to you, want to hear that. Um, but it might be related to, you know, the condition overall, um, or it might be related to some of those trade-offs we were talking about and trying to avoid those. 
Um, you know, so we're, we're going to maybe to help get us thinking around this, uh, start with a polling question. And this will be our finally, final polling question of the day. So one last time with me, please pull out those phones, uh, open up that tab on your browser, go to pollev.com forward slash ataxia. And here we are, uh, short of a cure, what outcomes are most meaningful to you in a future treatment? And please select up to three here. So we want you to, uh, I know this is hard uh, to pick amongst these, these, many of these things we've heard uh, or, or have beginning to hear that they're important, um, but try to prioritize, pick and rank those top three. The options are A, slowing or stopping disease progression, B, regaining strength and or muscle function, C, improving coordination and balance, D, lessening of pain, E, lessening of fatigue, F, improving ability to walk, uh, G, capacity to go to school or work, H, decreasing numbness or tingling, I, improving cognition, J, decreasing seizures, K, improving speech, or L, some other outcome that's not listed on this slide, but to you would be most meaningful for you to in a future treatment. Um, and here again, you can pick up to three options. So we'll give you a couple of moments here to uh, think about this and uh, provide your ranking. Uh, we are seeing percentages of responses again. Um, so this is kind of a general ranking by bars um, that, that are being viewed. Some of the same things that we saw earlier in the day. Yep. So we'll give you a few more moments to get in responses. As it stands, it looks like um, the thing that is uh, uh, what you're reporting as being most meaningful to you in a future treatment is uh, the slowing or stopping of disease progression, followed uh, number two kind of in the ranking being improving of coordination and balance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, a, a bit distant behind those two would be um, improving speech and improving the ability to walk, uh, kind of in uh, pretty close neck and neck is three and four. Um, and then maybe, you know, a fifth would be regaining strength and or muscle function. However, we do see, uh, I am seeing all those uh, small numbers, um, each of those other um, uh, treatment uh, goals listed as uh, top three for, for some of you. Um, so uh, don't want to discount that at all. Um, we want to understand why it is uh, you've selected the top three, whatever those top three are here. And we even have a few others, so we definitely want to hear what those are. What else? What did, what did we not include in this polling question um, that you would view as most meaningful you, for you in a future treatment? And then the big, big question is why? Why is this the, some, that thing that would be most meaningful to you? Um, so let's uh, you know, have one, one final discussion here as a group. It's been a long day, I know, but uh, this is a really important one. And so. Um, if you want to call in, we encourage you to do so. That number is 1-703-844-3231. Um, and of course, you can also write in with your comments. Keep using that comment box um, under the live stream here today. Uh, but let's um, uh, kick it to our Zoom panel here. Um, and, you know, I, you know, I want to maybe start with uh, Greg, you know, Greg, we had started with you and, and you had mentioned that you're not on any medications now. So I'm really interested from your perspective, you know, of what would be most meaningful for someone that's kind of in your stage. Why don't you get us started? Greg? The, the uh, system in early progression, uh, stopping progression would be the most important thing to me. Stop where it stops progression where I'm at now, where I can continue to live independently like I am. Um, and, and with that, stopping progression and not necessarily slowing progression. Okay. Because I, I think slowing progression would be hard to evaluate and judge. For instance, me... My, each per, each individual progresses at a different rate, and and it, and they don't know. They can't predict how long my pr progression will be. So if I take a drug and it's five years, well, that could have been normal for me. Mm -hmm. You know, so, normal yeah. progression could have been five years. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's more important to stop progression to me. Right. 
Sure, sure. Thank you, Greg. Um, kind of similarly, you know, kind of where you're in your, your stage, Jessica, it's uh, probably a little different than maybe some others. Um, what were you thinking when you saw that polling question? You know, where for yourself uh, maybe would you pr uh, prioritize of those treatment goals? Right. Um, d uh, for me, definitely the age of onset. Um, I, I don't want to deal with this for as long as I can. Um, and then after that, probably balance and speech. Um, mm -hmm. It just seems with my dad, that's really what bothers him the most. Um, um, his night issues too, but um, balance is just so big. Mm -hmm. um, but priority, let's get this later in life as far as we can. Yeah, sure. That makes sense. Um, now we're going to kind of keep going through the rotation here, but uh, let's get, go with the caregiver perspective um, next. So, so Maya, uh, for you, thinking about uh, you know that the, whether it was the options that were presented or something else, you know, what in your view is um, you know a, a top priority for that next treatment, short of a cure? Well, short of a cure, it's definitely stopping the illness from. Um, going any further because then you can wait for the cure to arrive. But, um, um, you know, barring that, um, speech is extremely important. And I know everybody concentrates on movement because that takes the longest and that takes a lot out of people's lives. But not being able to say if you're in pain or um, how somebody can help you um, not being able to communicate is extremely important. And I think uh, regaining speech would be um, crucial for a lot of people. So I would go with um, speech would be my priority because movement, even I'm not saying that that's something uh, anybody should look forward to, but even if you're in, in a wheelchair, you can still access life. Um, if you can't speak and you can't communicate, you will get so isolated, you won't be able to get support, help. Um, it, it's very, very difficult one to tackle. So I would say that's really, really important. Absolutely. And and can I maybe just probe on that for a moment? You know, um, improvement in speech, that could mean a lot of different things. You know, what if, you know, what could, you know, be given back you know, that would, would mean something, you know, is there something in your mind that you think of that, you know, if I could just, you know, if they could just, you know, communicate in this way or this much, you know, that would be so helpful um, for, for communication. Um, there are, absolutely, there are many um, communication devices out there that we've tried uh, with our son like eye gaze mm -hmm. unfortunately because of his epilepsy he and and myoclonic movements he can't use that very uh, efficiently then uh, we've tried various modes of communication and, and support with communication but now he's at a stage where within three years um he's progressed from being an average high school kid to not being able to say virtually uh, you know it's single it went to single words and then yes and no and now it's mostly no and I dread the day when he loses the yes and no because mm. if something's hurting him I can start from the top of the head and said say is your head hurting is your neck hurting is are your arms hurting and I can get yes or no but if he stops saying yes or no it's going to be very very difficult for him um, to to make any decisions and communicate those decisions. So being able to even speak in single words would be incredible. Um, but again, it's the people's progression of illness. Everybody will have a different need. Mm -hmm. um, but I would definitely implore everyone to look at various options that are internet-based or a special device based where they can improve their communication um, because I think it's an extremely necessary part of our lives within society. Yeah, thank you so much, Maya. So uh, we're gonna, uh, I see that we have some written comments coming in, so we're gonna uh, jump over to that for a moment. We will come back to you, uh, Brian and Doug, uh, to get your views on this as well. Yeah. Um, but Andrew, why don't we share some of Yeah, those? well, I just wanted to share one. I think the decision about 
using a treatment, and someone brought this up earlier, um, Naho, who, whose daughter passed away from DRPLA, um, says medications that are easy to take because of the high frequency of intellectual and cognitive impairment and swallowing problems. So obviously whatever treatments are available have to be realistic um, for this community. And I think that's a theme we've been hearing. Yeah. Great. All right. So uh, I will, uh, you know, make a call. One more final pitch to if you have something to share on what you're looking for from a future treatment, please call in. That number is one seven zero three eight four four three two three one. This is your chance to have your treatment priorities, your treatment goals heard. Or of course, you can also write those in. Um, but to give uh, uh, a patient's perspective, someone living with ataxia. Uh, why don't we have Brian you share your, your treatment priorities uh, for a, fu a future uh, potential treatment option? Yeah, I, you know, I, I was thinking about that last polling question, and I think I would have answered it much different. Like three years ago, mm -hmm. my answer would be stop progression. Okay. Um, but now my answer is improve symptoms. Like, like I like if you could have stopped it three or four years ago where I was, then I I could have dealt with that a little bit better. But now it's progressed to a point where I, I want to improve my balance and coordination and get back to where I was three or four years ago. Um, and the other, the other thing is with um, the type that I have, SCA7, uh, there's some vision impairment. Mm. And so if I could improve my vision, that would uh, really improve my quality of life. Sure. And, and when you said some of the symptoms, maybe going back to where you were three years ago, can you describe that to me? You know, uh, maybe like you know, use an example, give me an example of where you were three years ago versus now to just may help me understand that a little bit. Yeah. Well, um, I mean, I, with balance, I, I stumble quite a bit more now, mm -hmm. but I mean, I wasn't, uh, able to run and do cartwheels, uh, mm -hmm. three years ago, but I was at least in a, a spot where I could go up and down stairs um, with a little more ease, where now it's a lot more difficult, just like um, coordination. I mean, coordination affects everything, and so everything is just more difficult. So, I mean, three years ago, things were just less difficult, and I think that's, um, I think that's the point. Sure, absolutely, Brian. Thank you so much. And uh, Doug, uh, why don't you give us the, the last word from the, our Zoom panel here? Uh, what would you like to see from that next future, future treatment? Well, uh, for me, uh, I think for all of us uh, taxi patients, because this is such a rare disease, uh, I, I rather than say what I would like the next thing to be. I would, we're basically the guinea pigs. So, you know, when you go to see your neurologist, you're not necessarily going to find make him or her make you feel better. You're just going so they can find a treatment for it. So I would encourage people to let, you know, I'm not going to invent a cure, but uh, my neurologist might. So I go to see him so he can just, he can find a cure. Sure. Thank you so much, Doug. And I want to I want to thank our whole Zoom panel here today, and 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 let them go uh, a few minutes early here. Um, I know that we do have a, a phone caller and some written comments that have come in, um, but thank you all to our, our Zoom panel. Um, on the phone, we have uh, Susan from North Carolina, uh, representing uh, SCA two, that wants to to share some of her perspectives on therapies. Um, so, Susan, are you with us? Yes, I am. 
Welcome. You know, you have talked about a lot of things today, but you have not ever talked about support groups. Mm-hmm. And I, I live in Asheville, North Carolina, and we started a support group you know, probably a year and a half ago, and the end is so amazing, you know, you know, there's probably 10 or 15 of us have ever been come, but, um, yeah. but we talk and, you know, throw things around and it's just, it's just really good. Um, last, last month, uh, we had Joel Sutherland at the, um, it's a talk, and if we don't have a speaker, we just you know talk about whatever our we're feeling, whatever, and it's just really great therapy to bounce around things with other affections. No, that that sounds it sounds like it is quite therapeutic in and of itself. Those uh, that support group. Um, uh, while I have you, Susan, any thoughts from you on, on what uh, for a future therapy would be important or valuable to you? Uh, do you mind if I ask you that? Well, you know, I'm, I'm 65, and I just feel like I'm too far gone, but my daughter is 30, and she has it, and mm-hmm. she's on the clinical trial for the um though, and I just would, you know, I just pray that there's something out there to stop the progression. Yeah, something to stop the progression. Um, Be- yeah, because, you know, it seems like that you get married and have kids, but, <clears throat> you know, um, she can't, you know, she can't have a kid because Ataxia has to stop with her generation. Right. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Susan. Really appreciate you calling in. Great call. Um, uh, I think we have a, a few more comments, and I think that will, uh, seeing no other phone callers in, uh, in the queue, I think uh, our written comments will have the final word for this. Yeah. Session. Well, there was one interesting one here. I think that's important. We've talked about because the progression of especially certain types of ataxia is slow, it's sometimes hard to know um, what, what's being beneficial and, and not. Um, a caregiver for DRPLA writes, inclusion criteria for any drug trial and also how effective any given drug is cannot and should not rely on symptom recordings only. It should rely on scientific evidence or improvement within biomarkers or other recordable data. I think that's very much getting at how um, again, sometimes seeing the symptom um, is not always the only piece that's important. The, the biomarker data um, can also kind of reveal uh, clinical benefit as well. So that's something important for future clinical trials. Sure, sure. And maybe, you know, not to put words in anyone's mouth, but when I hear something like that, it kind of sounds like you know, there's an interest you know, in seeing maybe that slowing or stopping of the, the disease that so many have talked about today. Um, you know, but how, how can we maybe know earlier right. that a treatment might be having an effect because it might take a long time, as many people even were worried, to see those, those types of benefits. Right. Um, so hear you loud and clear, and, and thank you to that caregiver. Um, any other comments, or is that it? I think that was the last one that I wanted to share right now. Great. Well, that, this concludes the part of the program where we um, you know, are getting your expert input, and we sure have gotten a lot of it today. Um, you know, as your moderator, you know, I you know, was truly moved um, by, by everyone, so many individuals with ataxias and DRPLA, and their, their caregivers, their, you, know, uh, you know, siblings, parents, spouses, um, truly, you know, coming to us and pulling the curtain back on what it means to live with ataxia. Um, I know uh, it's not an easy thing to do, and um, you know, we really were focused on you know those areas that where you need help, and that's not something that um, often you know uh, we like to focus on. You know, the, the negative aspects of living with a condition and and where we need help. Um, but what I can tell you is, you know, uh, from my experience working in this field, uh, working previously at FDA and, and still doing this all the time, is that your voices do matter. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, your everything that you've shared will help in figuring out what those right things to measure are and what does it mean when we see benefits uh, on those different outcomes and when we're considering the benefits and the risks of products you know dr uh, wilson bryan from fda laid that out so elegantly this morning um, and i think you know uh, from what i I've, I've seen today i know that that uh, is is it, we we did in fact you know meet that goal of getting that important input that we needed so i just want to really thank each and every one of you, um, as your moderator, you made my job easy, uh, and that's uh, always that. That means, uh, in, in my eyes, this was a very successful meeting. So, uh, I am very appreciative. Um, I now get the pleasure of handing this meeting over. Uh, we're going to have some uh, summary and concluding remarks. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce your uh, our speaker, giving a little bit of a summary of some of the things that we heard from you today, uh, and that is my my friend and colleague Larry Bauer. Uh, Larry uh, comes with a, a great deal of experience, um, 17 years as a, a research nurse at NIH, uh, over 10 years at the Food and Drug Administration, where he was one of the co-founders of the Rare Diseases Program within the Center for Drugs, um, and has actually been a key part of the, the team that helped plan this meeting. Um, so nobody better, to per perhaps, to give these summary remarks than uh, Mr. Bauer. So, so Larry, why don't you take it away? Thank you so much, James and Andrew. Um, I'd like to reiterate something that James said just a minute ago. We, we started the meeting today with um, Dr. Wilson Bryan from the FDA talking about how helpful uh, patient-focused drug development meetings are to the FDA, and specifically how they can help them when the FDA is trying to give guidance about designing clinical trials, about what the, the endpoints might be for those trials, as well as evaluating the benefit and risk of any new drug that comes to them to be reviewed because the FDA has the ultimate responsibility of making the decision whether this drug should um, be uh, allowed to come onto the market. And he also said, I think very poignantly, that the best education for the FDA comes from patients and care caregivers, and that you help the FDA to learn and to continue with their medical education. So after Dr. Bryan, we, we got a, an overview, a disease overview from Dr. Wilmot. Um, he talked about the SCAs as being a group of neurodegenerative diseases, um, with progressive ataxia as being the primary symptom but they also have a variety of other symptoms. And all the different types of the SCA1, 2, 3, 6, 7, 8, 17, and DRPLA, they share features, but each one is slightly different. But one thing they share is that these diseases are autosomal dominant in their inheritance pattern, which means that a child born to a parent that's a gene carrier, that child, every single child born has a 50% chance of developing um, this condition. And that's why throughout the day, we've heard of so many families that are affected with multiple family members. Um, some of the uh, symptoms that we heard about were related to cerebellar dysfunction were dysarthria or problems with speech, dysphagia, which is problems with swallowing and choking, um, balance issues, eye movement issues, uh, cognitive and emotional changes, as well as bladder dysfunction. Um, some of the muscle problems have to do with spasticity, which is tightening of the muscles, um, twitching. Um, there can be seizures, uh, issues with dementia and intellectual deterioration, um, dizziness and visual loss. Um, additionally, there there's, can be uh, psychological issues related to coping with this disease. Uh, so people are dealing with sadness, depression, and anxiety about the future. So after Dr. Wilmot, we divided the morning session into two sessions to talk about symptoms and impacts. And we had two panels. The first panel was really focused on ataxia itself and some of the neuromuscular symptoms. So these are some of the, you know, things like uh, balance, chorea, or, which is involuntary muscle movements, spasticity, weaknesses, reflexes, and gait. So our, one of our speakers, Stephanie, uh, that has SEA6, she said that she has five generations of family members that, that have been affected. Um, she herself started in, in the, her early 50s. She was one of the first people to say that this, this thing about being perceived as being drunk. We heard that throughout the day um, because of people's ataxia. Um, she was needed to retire at the age of 59, gave up driving, has had to use a walker, 
And even though she had good handwriting when she was younger, she now has to use computers and keyboards. And she said that another thing we heard repeatedly was that as the, the day progresses, people sometimes feel more fatigued. And she says that in the evening, she tends to mumble more. Uh, we also heard from uh, Destiny, who has SCA2. She's uh, talked about her senior year in high school and how much of a struggle it was to participate in physical education and to get from class to class. She talked about hand tremors, weakness and balance issues. Um, trouble with self-care, like showering. And when she was talking about falling, which is a symptom we heard over and over again, she, she mentioned that there's no warning, that this just comes out of the blue and she falls. Um, she, she also said that sometimes the, that she has non-motivation and gets depressed, and she's worried about progression of the disease. Uh, Gina, who has SCA3, she's got a dense family history as well. She started having balance issues at 44. Uh, once again, said that when she falls, she doesn't know when it's going to happen. She used a couple interesting terms to describe the symptoms, like she, crazy legs, or when she's air walking, that, that, that it feels like all of a sudden she's walking on air and then she falls. Um, she also said at times that, that when she has symptoms, that it feels like each of her legs weighs 100 pounds and she has trouble moving them. Um, that walking is painful. Um, she lives alone and is very worried about losing independence. Um, we heard from a couple, Jason and Sherry. Uh, Jason has SCA7. Um, Jason and Sherry also had two children with SCA. Their son, Jordan, started with symptoms at 14 months. He did, just couldn't master walking and he fell. But within 15 months, he was bedridden and he eventually needed a feeding tube and his disease rapidly progressed and Jordan died when he was three. Their daughter, Sydney, was diagnosed at age four and a half with gait and balance issues. She lost her eyesight and died at age eight. So we can see the tremendous impact that this disease has on some families. And then the dad, Jason, he started progress progressive ataxia at age 32. And his he noticed first coordination and gait being off and now he uses a uh, a walker and a wheelchair when he's outside of the house. So then we move to panel 1B, the, the second panel, and this was other health effects. So these were things like visual symptoms, problems with speech, swallowing, memory, dementia, epilepsy, and behavioral issues. Um, we first heard from Tom with SCA1. He's Three of his seven children have been diagnosed with SCA as well. And for him, choking has become a common occurrence. And he says that when he has a, a choking episode, he can cough sometimes for 15 minutes. And he said the challenge of being able to speak clearly is actually the most frustrating part of his disease. Uh, he mentioned that word retrieval is very slow, which makes him talk more slowly. And he also mentioned controlling his emotions is an ongoing challenge. We also heard from Cameron, who's got SCA7. She was diagnosed fairly recently in 2015. She's currently in college, but she types slowly, speaks slowly, and needs accommodation in school and actually took this semester off because of the challenges of e-learning. She said that she felt like she was going to fall all the time. And I thought it was interesting. She, she described it as that my mouth wasn't able to keep up with my brain. Uh, she also said kind of globally that living with ataxia is a nightmare and I'm trapped in a body that I can't control. And Christy has three members with uh, DRPLA. Her son Reggie had severe cognitive impairment and a decreasing IQ and uncontrolled seizures, sometimes having six to 12 seizures in a 24 hour period. Period. Uh, by 13, he was regressed and needed a wheelchair and spoke less, and he died in 2016 after an emergency episode of breathing difficulty. She also has a daughter, Maya, who developed tr uh, terrible seizures and progressive atrophy with IQ decline, decreased verbal skills, and by age 16, included immune dysregulation, which we hadn't heard before. And her mom said, I just wish she could take care of herself again. It's just been a series of progressive losses for her. And then the last uh, person we heard from in the morning was Jeanette, who has SCA type 3, which she said is also nicknamed Machado Joseph disease. Uh, Jeanette's 35 years old. She has challenges with speech, swallowing, her vision's affected. She tends to choke and cough until she vomits sometimes. Um, her and her husband considered having children, but they 
before they had children, they decided to get a dog. And Jeanette learned that even taking care of a dog had a lot of challenges. So I think she forgo having children, um, which was a, a, a special challenge in itself. And she said sometimes she has trouble recalling words when speaking, and it becomes a guessing game. So after the morning, we... we we, we took our lunch break, we came back, and we saw a video of a severely impacted family with DRPLA. The father was affected, the daughter's affected, and the mother was the caregiver on both ends of the spectrum for both her husband and the daughter. And this added, it just compounded her problems when, uh, when there's multiple people affected. And yet, through it all, she expressed tremendous hope for the future, which was uh, just amazing to hear. So then we moved into the afternoon talking about treatments and what would people like to see in the future. A couple things, we, we, we know that there are no FDA approved treatments for SCA or D, DRPLA, although there are some things in development. Um, currently, everything that's available is to treat symptoms. Um, and what uh, another global thing, you know, with ataxia being a primary symptom, we heard pretty much that exercise is uh, something that most people and many people try to do to help with their, uh, in their treatment. Um, some of the issues with, with developing a treatment is this, this is a very rare disease. It's slowly progressing, so it's hard to measure change. And there's very variable presentations with all the different forms of SEA and DRPLA. So in panel two, we heard from Carrie, who has um, four out of her seven children have juvenile onset DRPLA. Um, she said the treatment center more on accommodation than actual improvement. And all of her, her children need to see a psychiatrist for behavioral issues. Uh, her son, Aaron, takes three different drugs to help him sleep, but still only gets four to six hours of sleep a night. And she'd really like to see something that would slow the process and she wants to treat ataxia and prevent seizures from starting. We heard from Hannah with SCA1, who was diagnosed at age 36. She tried PT, but it seemed like her PT didn't know much about her disease. Uh, we've heard that also again and again, that often uh, the healthcare professionals aren't that familiar with, with this disease. Um, because her improvement was so slow, her, she was canceled on her insurance coverage and stopped PT. But she does try to keep up with exercising 30 to 60 minutes every day. And um, she's participated in a clinical trial. And she's willing to put up with side effects on a new drug if the treatment seems to be effective. Uh, Jessica for, with SCA3, she's a gene carrier. Um, her and her husband, when they decided to have children, they actually did in vitro fertilization with selective uh, selection of the embryos that were not carriers of the SCA gene. Um, and she's had three children that way, and all three of the children are not uh, carriers of the SCA gene, which is great. She does not have symptoms yet, but would really like to see a delay in the onset of symptoms and prevention or cure for the gene itself. Um, her dad has SCA. He's needed three eye surgeries that just give him short-term relief. He uses off-label drugs, including um, citalopram, and none of the treatments really help. Um, there's a lot of desperation for real treatments, and they're willing to do anything. Uh, we heard from Eric, SCA2, and his sister, Michelle. He tried Shantix for balance, but it didn't help and had bad side effects. Um, he said that med medical marijuana helped his sleep and appetite, but it was so expensive to keep up with that he discontinued it. Um, he uses modafinil, which is a stimulant for fatigue, but he also, once again, said he wants something to stop, a treatment to stop the progression. And our final panelist of the afternoon was Brett, who has SCA1. Um, he's 34 years old. Um, Brett really loves to exercise. He set a, 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 a record for doing push-ups. He did 2,334 push-ups in an hour, which broke the record, uh, which was amazing. He's tried baclofen and chlorzoxazone, which help with spasticity, even though they cause side effects. He uses green tea powder for energy and OTC arginine. Um, he tried CBD, wasn't effective. Um, he does balance exercises. And he most would like to see a new drug that could help with balance. He says it would just make him feel a lot more confident. Um, Let's see. 
And we heard from one of the call or one of our panelists that massage really helps. It, it tends to help with overall body relaxation and muscle relaxation. Several people mentioned water therapy. Um, that that's uh, it, it was really helpful to a young man with DRPLA as well as a woman with SCA15. Um, folks have tried acupuncture, Chinese herbs, and those things have helped somewhat with neuropathy. One of the things that I heard from several people is that sometimes they just don't know if a treatment is really helping or not, but they choose to keep it using it because they, they don't want to take the risk that it's at. If they stop taking it, that they're going to have uh, further progression. Um, and we heard from one person, too, that CBD works for sleep, but it can make you unstable walking. So you have to be careful how you use it. Um, and another thing that someone said was that they would really like to see um, an improvement in symptoms like vision, balance, speech, and that we need realistic treatments. So now at this point, I'd like to turn the meeting back over to Andrew and Andrea, and they will finish the day for us. So thank you very much. Thank you, Larry, for that wonderful recap. So I have some late breaking news from Capitol Hill that I wanna share with you all. This has just been handed to me and I'm gonna read it because I think you're gonna be very interested in this. The National Ataxia Foundation and the Friedrichs Ataxia Research Alliance are excited to announce that today, the United States Senate introduced a bipartisan resolution declaring September 25th, 2020, National Ataxia Awareness Day. We anticipate unanimous passage within days NAF and FARA would like to acknowledge the leadership and support of our co-sponsors, U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren from Massachusetts and U.S. Senator Cindy Hyde-Smith from Mississippi for their commitment to raise awareness of ataxia. This powerful legislative statement is a direct result of advocacy by the ataxia community. Thank you for sharing your stories and experiences with ataxia. Your voice was heard. Man. How cool is that, huh? That's great. Yeah, so that's pretty exciting, uh, and I wanted to share that with you all. Okay, so now back to my, back to my closing remarks. Um, I don't know about you, but I am feeling totally motivated to get back to work on helping to find treatments and an eventual cure for ataxia. I'm also feeling so grateful for all the people who helped put this meeting together. Thank you to the FDA staff members who tuned in today. We know how hard you're all working right now with the huge added challenge that the pandemic presents. And we truly appreciate you taking time out of your schedules to join us. A special thank you to Shannon Cole from the FDA who helped guide us throughout the planning process. Thank you to our meeting sponsors. We simply couldn't hold an event like this without your support. Thank you to the team at Dudley Digital who somehow connected hundreds of us today without a hitch. You all rock. Thank you to the National Ataxia Foundation staff who have worked tirelessly for the past year to make this meeting happen. A special shout out to Kelsey Trace and Sue Hagen. Thank you both. And finally, a heartfelt thank you to our panelists for all the work you did in preparing for this meeting and sharing your stories today. And to all of you who called in or made online comments, your bravery and passion came shining through. The impact of this meeting will be felt for years to come. Thank you all for making today a major milestone in our continued pursuit to find treatments for ataxia. I'll now turn it over to my friend and partner in this meeting, Andrea Compton from Cure DRPLA for her closing comments. Andrea. Thank you, Andrew. I agree, it was an amazing day. I'd also like to thank Dr. Wilson Bryan for his thoughtful opening remarks and Dr. Chip Wilmot for his remarks on the clinical features of SCA and DRPLA and the therapeutic approaches. And of course, I'd like to thank James and Andrew for doing such a great job moderating today. And I also have a special shout out to Sue Hagen for reaching out to me last March and asking if Cure DRPLA wanted to participate today. That was a very bright spot in an otherwise bleak 2020. <laughs> also, a special shout out to Kelsey Trace, who was not only a complete pleasure to work with, but did so much to organize today's meeting. So we've had this great meeting. What's next? You've done your part. Now it's time for NAF and Cure DRPLA to do ours. Based on all of the information provided today, we are going to produce a voice of the patient report. Once published, that report will be publicly available on both the NAF and Cure DRPLA websites. It's also important to note that the web link for comments will remain up 
for the next 30 days. So please feel free. Your comments will be counted if you, if you um, put a comment in prior to October 25th. There will also be links to the replay of today's meeting on both the CureDR PLA and the NAF website. And a huge thank you to everyone who made today a success. Back to you, Andrew and James. Thanks, Andrea, and thanks to everyone for making this a terrific day. Stay safe out there.